Hello, we are live. Whoop, the camera's we, very we are. high. Oh shit, I should probably pull it up then. Ooh. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't have... I'm trying to do like a thousand things right now, and... I know the feeling. That's why I haven't didn't stream the last few days, is because like, I've just been so busy with stuff. I'm trying to enter this like, board game design contest that is like, due on Monday. So I'm playtesting that, adjusting it, trying to get Whiteboard Game Season 2 set up. All sorts of crap. So, hopefully I can get it all done in time. What's happening on your end? I'm seeing you playing Banjo Tooie. Well, that's, that's one thing. Ah, shoot. Hold on. Gotta switch to the right account. Hello. What? Uh, sorry, no, it said hi, Iggy. <laughs> the Xbox did, so I, uh. I am polite, alright. I will answer the video game when it talks to me. Do you do, do that with Google where you're like, uh, please find Big Teddy Golf Girlfriend. Thank you. I do it with Siri because I have Siri. And I use her mostly as a timer, honestly. Uh, I yell at it like a middle-aged dad yelling at a fucking waiter in a foreign country. Oof. Like, hey Google, set a timer for four hours. Or if I want like, oh, it's actually setting a timer for four hours. <laughs> <laughs> God, it was rough for like a few weeks, that's why I kind of stepped away for a minute, but... I what's, wish I had. What's up, really with, uh, what's up with you in the Twitterverse? So, I was talking about the WWE with, uh, what well, Culture's Andy... Or, uh, he had posted something on Twitter and I responded like, Yeah, it stopped a year and a half ago. I don't think I, there's anything they could book to ever bring me back. No storyline, no match. Yo. Nothing they could do to bring me back. Because of all the news today, which you saw earlier as well. Yeah, you sent me that, and it's like, man, too. On one hand, too little, too late, and on the other hand, just getting worse. Yeah, so for those who don't follow wrestling and don't really know much, uh, Iggy and I are big fans of AEW, and we're not going to pretend we're not biased. Oh, certainly. We, we very much are biased towards AEW. Yeah, I mean, it's just um, better, so... Yeah, uh, the storylines are better, we like, you know... Now, here's the thing. The talent is great at both companies. We're not saying that the talent is bad. It's mainly management, is what right. it comes down to. And WWE writes a show for a viewer of one. Oh god, why is Chris Delia fucking trending? No, no. But, regardless, the uh, uh, WWE, their stories have just been bad because, you know, they fired the one guy that was making them decent. Uh, man. Immediate notice of dropping quality. Yep. 
Uh, like, it was last week they fired Paul Heyman. I just grabbed that burger. Uh, so they right? Who had been the creative director on Raw, and by all accounts, I haven't been watching, but it had gone up in quality. Mm-hmm. Uh, then, they put Paul Heyman in, and supposedly it got really good. Like, oh, okay, cool. It's fine. I'm not going to tune in because, you know, everything else going on with the management and just horrible people. Right. But, you know, I'll give him a shot. Oh, I keep up with, like, the wrestling news big time. Big time. So, today the word got out that they were, they had banned masks at their events. Like, Yep. Not allowed to wear masks. And now WWE is saying, oh, we never did that. We did this. No, we did that. I'm like, bullshit. There's you proof, got bud. Caught. You yeah. got caught in your pit. You're, you're backtracking now. Yeah, you can't, you can't get one past people in this day and age. Everybody is constantly keeping an eye on everything. They weren't testing for COVID to begin with. Yep. People, they were not testing their talent coming in and out, opening closed indoor space like you could argue well what about AEW they're, they're, they have talent in the you know, seats in an open air arena socially distanced wearing masks and AEW tests every single fucking person that goes in and out of the building yes uh, one over two banning masks at a wrestling event yeah Irony. like the luchadors are fucking pissed um Oh, <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Uh, but yeah, uh, they work tests, or AEW tests their talent, puts masks on them. Uh, mm -hmm. Not all of them wear their masks, but that is neither here nor there. They know everyone in there should be, you know, clean. Yeah. Because um, they're doing a two-day test method before you're allowed in. Yeah, and then they give you a, a wristband and... If they're not wearing a wristband, they're wearing. I saw some of the refs had instead of a wristband a uh, like a little tape ring on their thumb. Yeah. yeah. And so they have done everything they can to keep it safe. The talent is in an open air arena where you know uh, Fauci, I believe it was, said it's safer. Yeah. And the main thing that's gonna make that. Like, right now, the most common way to contract it is just sharing air with someone who has been, uh, infected. And so, a closed-in area with plexiglass enclosing you, um, it gets crazier from there. The talent was shuffled or driven from South Florida to North Florida in a bus. Mm, no. Oh yeah, to sit as an audience, they were forced to take a break. They like worked a 12-hour day or something like that. It was a ridiculous amount of time. You can find these articles on WrestleTalk.com. Uh, they're a great resource. But uh, they were bust in. They weren't allowed to go in the back with the main roster talent. They had to go outside into a tent for their breaks. They weren't allowed in catering. They were required to pack their own lunches. Um, to her credit, main roster star Nikki Cross bought all of the pizza. Hmm. Shouldn't have had to. Yeah, no, that's that should just be fucking provided. It's yeah. basic craft services. You have talent who need to eat. These are professional athletes. They need calories. Yeah. So, they did that. And then... Oh, God, I need to pull up the whole thread because there was a lot of stuff they did today that really fucking made me live it. So, I'm just going to give you the headlines real quick. Yep, yep. Uh, they're finally in June, starting today, testing their talent for COVID. Yep. Because they fucking got a case of it, 
and their performance center, um, where somebody caught it and went to the performance center and potentially spread it around. Um, they actually are bringing in more people to the shows as fans, friends and family of talent so far from what I've seen. Uh, on top of the, like, banning masks thing, which they're now saying, no, 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 it's, it's not banned, it's not banned. Yeah. Right. So, it's just unconscionable, right? Yeah, there's no, no excuse for any of it. And so I mentioned, you know, with all that going on, it's been a year and a half since I've watched. I'm not tuning into WWE anymore because they don't care about their talent. At exactly, all. and that's just not only is like that's bad for business in so many ways. Like a, not caring about your talent. Like they are your business. So if you don't treat them well, it's the same as running like a plow horse to its death. It's like you, if you do that, you're only gonna get a few years out of that horse, or you could be like good to it and make it live. For a long time and then especially with entertainment it's like hey a lot of the people consuming your the content that is part of your business are there because they like the talents so if you're treating the talents badly you become an enemy in their eyes so it just is double fold of like pure incompetence that that's not a business that should be able to last and it's not going to last much longer. The only reason the only reason they've existed as long as they have is because up until the Montreal screw job, everything was hidden. And then once they came out of hiding with that, they kept it all very guarded. But now that more and more information is coming out, people are not gonna tolerate it. And part of the problem for WWE is phones. Just cell phones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, know, you can't hide anything anymore. Although there was also uh what was it like a couple months ago? I think uh, before the pandemic started, there was uh, someone accidentally uploaded like a full rehearsal video to the WWE YouTube channel. I mean, accidentally, I say, but I feel like that was that was on purpose. Like, it's hard to know, right? But. Then you go back just like a little bit farther, and you've got WWE right after Jamal Khashoggi died. Well, well died, was murdered. Yeah, very, very uh, certainly murdered. Continuing to work with the Saudi prince. And, like, oh, less than a couple of weeks later, they were doing a show in Saudi Arabia. But they just didn't mention that it was in Saudi Arabia on any of their shows, so that nobody would know, like, Bro, we know you're in Saudi Arabia. Like, you can't pretend you're not. We know you're taking blood money right now. And so, here's an interesting thing that happened at one of those shows. They... So, WWE's official stance is nothing untoward happened. It was all just a mechanical error. That's why the plane couldn't take off. Right? Right. Then, the story started leaking out that no, 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 what really happened is uh, WWE was owed money by Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. and WWE refused to air the pay-per-view occurring in Saudi Arabia in Saudi Arabia until they were paid back. Oh. So, part way through the show, they started airing the show. And, the, suddenly, Crown Prince is fucking livid. So he held the talent hostage when they tried to leave at the end uh, of the show. Oh no. And people are like, no, that's not what happened. That's not what happened. You know, that's just rumors and bullshit. Well, now. We have a former star who was there and was lucky enough to get on a private plane, which narrows it down to about three people. Yeah. Uh, it's very easily three people. Um, saying, no, that's exactly what happened in a court testimony. And it's very, like, yeah. list of potential people that it could be because you got a Venn 
diagram of two things. Former star that was able to get a private plane now. Right. Uh, there's only three people that fit that bill at the time. Mm -hmm. And so, who it was is fairly like, you know, it's probably fairly easy to guess who it was that gave that testimony. Yeah. But now they're like, uh, no, um, that person's lying. Like, it's a court testimony, my man. Yeah, no, that's not how that works. They're not likely to be lying about this. Whereas you are. I mean, you're already taking fucking blood money. I don't trust you to keep telling me the truth. Ever. You know, why would I? And so it's just fucking nuts that, you know, I comment on this, and some guy's response is, what, you want a cookie? Like, people are being put at fucking risk of death, and your response is, so fucking die, dude. Like, there is no need for it. We can wait for entertainment like that. Or you can do it in a safe way, like AEW does. And I honestly feel like AEW probably would have taken a break, but I'm presuming the contracts force them into a situation where they have to still show something every week. Like, they have that time slot. And I'm sure TNT isn't just going to let them leave it blank. So... <laughs> What I would have done early on is I would have gotten all the talent together and did like they did with the Georgia tapings mm -hmm. and pre-record a bunch of shit at Daly's place. Yeah. I think that would have been a safe thing to do. I think. Like, I, I don't want to say that AEW did anything right or wrong. I think that under the circumstances, they're doing what they can. Yeah. Yeah. And they're doing a lot of things right in that. <sighs> they are testing, they are making sure everyone's safe, they are... You know, my concern is for travel more than anything. Right, yeah. I mean, a lot of them are taking planes, which when you see the planes, they're empty, so... It, or they're either empty or they're road tripping most of the time. Right. It's, so... Uh... Matt's been driving in every day for his tapings instead of flying. But my thing is, like, I don't want anyone being put at risk through airplanes because people have already given up on wearing masks in public. Oh, certainly. Like, they gave up pretty much immediately, honestly. And what's interesting is the protests have shown no spike in coronavirus. Um, not yet, but it, it's still within a period where uh, the symptoms and everything will not show. Right, but it's, it's rather surprising so far. Yeah. Point is, AEW has done some things I wasn't a fan of, but they've done every like they explain. Oh no, no, here's what we've done different. Right. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's fine. WWE doesn't have that though. They could have, from this get-go said, due to the ongoing coronavirus pandemic, we are unable to perform live shows. We don't want to put on less than our best product. We have a large backlog of shows like Saturday Night Main Event, and, you know, they have a bunch of shows they have a backlog of. Mm -hmm. A lot of shows that they have a backlog of that never made it to television because it's on the WWE network. Right. What they could have done with all this is say, we will instead, for the time being, air unaired footage from those shows you know, until such time as we can either A, safely record again in a closed setting, or B, bring back fans in a safe manner. Because right. they've got years of backlog. They have to fill three hours a week. That's nothing. You know, they've got years of backlogs. Um, or, God. Instead, what they did was they did, like, crappily pre-recorded stuff. Right. Followed by, like, adding a pay-per-view match for the first two weeks. Uh, I'm gonna do...
Um, you can keep talking, but I'm just gonna do some quick troubleshooting here because uh, this the game audio and the game video is out of sync. So let me try a couple things here. But uh, feel free to keep talking. I'm not gonna go off air for it. Yeah, but um, it's just like baffling to me that uh, WWE is just this terrible, and people are like, eh, whatever sucks for WWE. How do you hear that people are being put at risk of dying? And your first reaction is, as long as I get to see Bork Lesnar, like fucking, you've got to have something better in your life than that. <sighs> yeah. Like, it's good. And especially in, like, trouble stressful times, um, it is, uh, it is nice to have a distraction, but like it should not come at the 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 uh the detriment of people's lives. Expense. Expense is actually the word I was thinking of. Apparently the Chris Delia thing is um He's a fucking creep. Oh, great. Well, I don't know. What did he do? Uh... If it's, if it's like, graphic or, uh, could be triggering, like, the, uh, you know, don't have to go into too much detail. So, I'll put it this way. Uh, is playing a character on Netflix mm -hmm. that is a comedian who is secretly a sexual predator. Okay. And apparently he was typecast, we'll say. Oh no. Um, so, solicited nudes from a girl when she was 17 years old. Ooh. Uh, I saw something about a girl who was, um, god, what was it, targeted by him when she was like 16, um, yeah, he's a fucking pedophile, so, apparently. To which a lot of people are tweeting things like, wow, this Chris Delia news really makes you think, it's always the first person you expect. Yeah. Like, I don't know that I've ever heard any Chris Delia stuff. I keep getting him mixed up with Dan Cummins. Like, visually. Right. Like, they do look and, similar, yeah. Yeah, and so, like, I can never remember which one does the jokes. It's like, that joke is, will not be called Chainsaw Juggling Clowns. Like, and yeah. who, I can never remember which one that is. That's Dan Cummings. Okay, so... From what I know, he's a decent guy. I don't know fucking whether he is or not, but the other one not. What the fuck? The audio is like out of sync in the other direction now. It's like coming too early for the video. Let me try that one more time. Um, but yeah, it's really unfortunate to hear that. And honestly, kind of segueing back, I feel like that is one of the things that AEW has kind of, kind of like disappointed me in is um their their views on like sexual harassment and like kind of just how they treat the women in their league like the women's side of AEW seems kind of like an afterthought compared to the men's side and yeah. between between like really hyping up Mike Tyson who is a convicted rapist and um uh like what Dustin did to Jake Hager's wife at well, revolution was like just really gross and is not like not a moment that should be in any wrestling match in this day and age yeah and they repeated that spot more or less on dark with leva bates and marco stunt and i was very annoyed by that oh yeah yeah we never talked about that but i remember that happening that was pretty 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 gross and like i don't yeah. There's no need like, for that, so I don't know why they keep continue to do this. And like, for those watching who don't know what we're talking about, the spot was 
uh, forced kisses. Yeah. Like, um, just creepy. Uh, I think that... Okay, that's as close as I'm gonna get with the audio. I think it's still just a touch off, but it's not nearly as noticeable. But yeah, that's just, that's, that's the major thing that, uh, AEW has done that has disappointed me. And yeah. it's, it's not really a small thing, unfortunately, but compared to pretty much every other promotion, it's, it, yeah. it's still a much better promotion. <laughs> yeah, uh, their, their pros far outweigh their cons. Um, but they could really work on their women's division. Yeah, it's like it's not terrible, terrible. but it's it's seeing what they do, seeing what they do with all the other, like with the tag team and the heavyweight, and now the TNT. It's like all of those championships have gotten so much more, um, just like they've just been stellar, and then uh, the women's division has just been underwhelming in comparison. It's still technically fine, but yeah, there's not really any storyline. They've only really just made Britt Baker, like, an interesting character. Which now, with her her whole, like, Rolls-Royce bit and everything, like, I'm I'm starting to actually like her a bit. Shit, the, the idiot heel move is pretty fun. Yeah, it, it's not bad. Can you it's, hear me? Yeah. Okay, I had to pause my mic for, my mic for a second. Um, I mean, yeah, it's similar to how, like, Sammy Guevara, I've really, he, I've really come around to his gimmick. Like, I, I, I do enjoy him, but he's still nowhere near my favorites. Right. He's, I just don't, like, I just don't feel like it's a waste of time following him now. And Britt Baker is about that point, too. When it goes to her, I'm actually kind of interested in what she's going to do. I think Sammy's I think it was it was him and the the match he had against Darby Allen that really cemented him as like a lot more than we we gave him credit for. That match was really impressive. I would say that I was kind of always on with him, like I was tipping towards liking him, like especially once he joined the first circle, and that was big. Right. Oh yeah. That's where I feel like I turned around and saw him and went, oh. This guy's funny. I, yeah, this guy has all the tools necessary. He just needs to be pointed in the right direction. Oh god, this one's a hard one because I hate most of these games. <laughs> this one of those you can only pick three, no explanations go. Uh, so, oh, what do you got? Super Mario, Legend of Zelda, Kirby, Pokemon, Metroid, Sonic the Hedgehog, Mega Man, Animal Crossing, Pikmin, Fire Emblem, F-Zero, Golden Sun, Donkey Kong, Advance Wars, Xenoblade Chronicles, Persona, God of War, Sly Cooper, Jack and Daxter, Ratchet and Clank, Final Fantasy, Resident Evil, Silent Hill, Uncharted, Halo, Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, Gears of War, Devil May Cry, Castlevania, Crash Bandicoot, Spyro, Metal Gear Solid, Doom, Bioshock, Kingdom Hearts, Fallout, Monster Hunter, Grand Theft Auto, Dark Souls. Uh, uh, that's a hard one. I'm gonna, I'd have to it's say... It's hard for me because I hate all but the three I'll list. Um... And I know that is. I'm talking, I will not play them. I would say, honestly, Zelda, Zelda, Advance Wars, uh, 
Kingdom Hearts. I can't. Uh, uh, Spyro. I think Spyro. I, I had the most, like, actual fun with that game. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna put, like, a caveat on all of these. Mm -hmm. Kingdom Hearts, except for 3, and the one where you play with cards. Ah, uh, uh, the b Chain of Memories is better than people give it credit for. I'm gonna no, say that right now. Not. I hated that one. You just, you don't three, know? 3 is better, but, so 3 was pretty Kingdom bad. Hearts, Let's say, okay, let's say you not only get to only keep three, but you only get to keep one in each of the series that you pick. All right, the first one, Mars. First one, okay, I'll accept that. The second one had the Finny fun, and I won't ever forgive them for that. Did you see the, re the thing they're releasing is uh, Kingdom Hearts Rhythm Game? Oh, no, but uh, uh, Rhythm Games are pretty hit and miss. I hate Rhythm Games. I, they I, I, they I, I, can yeah. be good, but like 90% of them are not very well done. I don't like them. They're not my thing. Uh, yeah. So they're releasing a rhythm game, Kingdom Hearts. That's what I hated about Kingdom Hearts 2. Um, Fair. Yeah, that the entirety of Atlantis was pretty underwhelming. So the first one from that series. Nope. Pokemon. Um. Yes, you only get one per, per series to make it harder. I'm gonna go a little shocking here, I think. Okay. Let's go Eevee. Let's go Eevee, really? Okay. This is the first one I've ever been able to legitimately max up or complete the Pokedex in. Fair. I wish you had wild battles. Right. But, but, it introduced a lot of things I liked that they kept for Sword and Shield. Yeah. Namely, seeing a lot of Pokemon wandering around. Which is what everybody's wanted for ever. Like, that's when everybody's like, oh, make a Pokemon MMO. That's really all they want, is to just see the Pokemon running around while they're playing. To make it feel more like a real Pokemon universe. Oh. Oh. Sorry, I really fucking hate this boss. Like, this is my least favorite part of this game, because the flight controls are difficult enough without fucking having to also do first-person aiming. Uh, it's so disorienting. It's really fucking hard. He's all floppy and shit. And so even though you're using the grenade eggs, which have splash damage, so you don't have to be super accurate, it's a pain in the ass. I'm sh honestly shocked that I'm almost going to get this on the first try. Uh, uh, the reason why I uh, let's go over Sword and Shield, mm -hmm. Sword and Shield didn't have a fucking story. I, I honestly haven't even started it. We have both. I finished Sword and Shield, played the post-game content, and it was fucking livid. Because it doesn't have a story. It, like, you, you keep encountering the story, and then uh, an adult will run in and be like, No, you just keep going to the next gym, we'll handle the story. I Yeah, that was my big problem with... Uh... <laughs> Sun and Moon as well, is that, honestly, that's a lot of, po of like, not even just Pokemon games, but games in general, I find is, um, a lot of them, people's idea of a game story is, there is a story, but it doesn't really involve you. You kind of help from time to time, but for the most part, it's not your story. It's someone else's story that you're just kind of watching, and at that point, it's like, it, it's such a disservice to the fact that games can make you experience a story, not just, like, watch a story, but actively be a part of it. And so, d just relegating it to, someone else is having a story, and you're also there. Borderlands also has that problem. I think I'm coming around on that a little bit, if just because the plot is that you are just a hired mercenary, so the idea of you not actually being a part of it kind of fits the theming. I guess it, it still kind of irritates me that late. Oh, fuck! But I'm one final, hit left on him. Okay. For my final choice, though, mm. 
the first Metal Gear Solid for the PS1. I ne I've never played a Metal Gear Solid. I only played this one. Okay. And I won't play the others because I just don't care enough. Yeah, the, those are games the where they have like full feature length cutscenes. Well, here's the reason I love that one. My cousin had it, but he also had a Game Shark. Oh. So from the first fucking start of the game, Water. I had uh, invisibility. Oh, that makes a I stealth had... game real easy. <laughs> yeah. I had uh, all the weapons, unlimited ammo, unlimited health, which makes that game so much more fun, because what I would do is you go up, like, the very first thing you do is you wind up swimming up through this thing into a... Uh, base, right? Like an enemy base. And you're in, like, basically the cargo unloading area. Right. And you take an elevator up to the, like, courtyard, I guess you could call it. And there's this stairwell that you have to climb or run up and then crawl through a vent. What right. I did was I would go up to that stairwell and it would. It, it did that thing where you go up and then you have to turn around and go the opposite direction. Oh, yeah. So I would go to that halfway platform, and I would fucking place landmines, and then turn off the invisibility so everyone could see me. But the landmines work by remote control. Right. So I could detonate each one individually at oh. my pleasure. So what I would do is I would go place the landmines, and then wait, or uh, draw enemies over by un, you know, by revealing myself, and then uh, hiding again and running away, and just wait until enemies ran down there and set up landmines, which would launch them ragged all through the air. Oh, and I would, I would just spend like a half hour doing that. It was the funniest damn thing to me. But then you get further in the game, and there's a character that uh, I, my cousin, played it first right. while I watched. And this was when analog controllers were first released. Oh I yeah, they were still brand new. And in fact, I'm pretty sure the uh, d default controller that came with the PlayStation did not have analogs, right? Like the original. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Which meant it also had no rumble either. I had never seen rumble in a controller before. Right. Oh yeah, I, you couldn't even get it in N64 without uh, buying the extra rumble pack. Right. So my cousin is playing the game. I have no idea that the controller can go up. So we get to this character who's like, uh, I'm a sidekick, right? Oh, uh, Otacon. Uh, with the I glasses, and he talk he's just talking no, about Mantis. anime. Mantis. 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 Oh, yeah. Fun so fact, that's, like, uh, he's voiced by Rob Paulson. So he, uh, or no, Cyborg Ninja is, but I don't fucking, I don't know that, but the... Well, he, the fun thing is he can read your memory card, and if you've got other games by the developer on there, he'll call them out. Yeah, I remember hearing about that easter egg. And so he does that first, which makes me go, shit, he's like, let me show you my power, place your controller on the table in front of you. <laughs> And so my cousin sets the controller down, and Psycho Man just does the little, like, eh, like, psychic hand gesture. And the controller just goes across the table, and I nearly shit myself. Because I'm, like, 12 at the oldest scene. That was, I didn't play it, but, like, the, by my understanding, like, Metal Gear Solid, that... At least the first one, like, really played around with everything that the PlayStation could do. Like, it did that, it did the memory card, um... It also had, like, a part where you had to, like... Uh, what was it? You had to, like, stealth around, like, a specific, like, frequency or something. Like, the, it, 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 you had to, like, put the controller into the second port so that they couldn't read your mind. And then also, if you want to call the colonel, you actually have to find his codex number on the picture on the back of the box. Which is just... It's such a casual thing that you never think about, that, that that's a genius move. But it's not the first time it was done. Well, probably not, they, but like, it's probably the first time that, that, at least that I can think of, that did it so frequently. 
well, I'm talking about the finding the frequency thing. Oh, sure. Uh, it was actually, I want to say, a Nintendo Entertainment System game. Uh huh. Original NES, I did it. Where it came with a letter. With the uh, copy of the game. Came with a letter. And what you had to do was soak the letter in water to get the necessary frequency for the game to continue. Oh, which is not only an anti-piracy thing, but then like a fun thing to do. Exactly. Was yeah. that, uh, I'm going to say that was either Takeshi's, Takeshi's Journey or uh, probably like a ninja game, I'd assume. That is like an old ninja like, no, it method. was Tropics, something or other. Star Tropics? Uh, no. Do not know. I vaguely remember hearing something like that, but that was the thing that was big in, like, a lot of CD-ROM games, because piracy for CD-ROMs was so high that often they would have, like, they would have, like, something in the, in the case, like a, a big tapestry picture that looked like gibberish, and you would have to, like, to, like, continue through the game, you would have to actually actively use that to solve a specific puzzle so that they could tell that you actually, like, bought the game and have the case and everything, but then if you buy it secondhand or anything, yeah, it, it was kind of short-sighted. But then again, so is all, like, anti-piracy measures, really. Yeah. Star Tropics, yeah. Star Tropics required you to destroy your copy protection. Uh, oh. Uh, especially bad case. Uh, early method of screwing with pirates consisted of including a code in the game's packaging so that at some point the pirates could be locked out of the game for not having it, as when a shitload of honest fires in that yeah. But especially bad case of this was Star Trek and Spreadiness, which seemingly went out of its way to make the code as easy to miss and throw away as humanly possible. So, uh, my controls for some messages here from one over two. Yeah, I think that's the character from Star Tropics. I was actually just playing it on the uh, NES online um, thing, but I didn't get very far in it. It's right. it's NES so, hard, so. So, say you're halfway through the game when you get stuck on a puzzle with only this clue. Tell Mike to dip my letter in water. Your Mike incidentally. Fine. Ah. Okay. You've been asked to do weirder things in Nintendo games. So you go through every pixel in the game trying to pick up anything vaguely resembling a letter, but you can't find it because it's not in the game. It's a physical sheet of paper that came in the game's box between all the safety warnings, subscription slips, and other shit you mom threw away the day you opened the game. But let's say you find the damn letter. Let's say you figure out you have to expose it to water to reveal a secret password. In that case, you better make sure you apply the exact amount of water needed. Add too little in the code will be readable. Add too much, the letter will fall apart as wet paper tends to do. Even if it works, we hope you remember to write down the code in case you ever want to play this game again, because as time passes, the writing fades out. And if you rented or bought the game secondhand and it came without the letter, these are your options. Call Nintendo's hotline, where Nintendo's officials will slowly and seductively tell you how to progress through their titles for a small fee. B. Mm -hmm. Waste money on a strategy guide to get a single password. Or C. Wait for that World Wide Web thing to catch on in a decade or so and ask the internet what it is. Today you can buy Star Tropics on Nintendo's virtual console where you can just submit a digital letter on a drawing of a bucket. Yeah, that's cute. I wonder if that's what they did in the NES Online uh, version that I was playing. I didn't get to that point, but I guess I'll, I guess I'll find out. Uh, apparently... One of the games uh, punished you. James Bond 007, The Stealth Affair. Cock blocked you from the start, which is kind of ironic considering this game started life as a James Bond ripoff and only became an official product when it was re released in America. Mm. Uh, you, you started the game hoping, hoping to be greeted by the classic image of James Bond shooting you in the face through your monitor. Instead, you're prompted with a terrible example of MS Paint Cubism in black and white. You also find a color version of the game is in, or of the same picture in the manual. So if you look at this black and white photo, you'll find the color version in the manual. At this point, you're asked to identify the color of a certain piece in this picture by looking at the manual. 
Easy enough, right? It would be if the red boxes to tell you which shape to identify with didn't work. Identify didn't stupidly encompass several pieces at once. Oh, you only have two chances to get it right because absolutely no one thought this thing through. So the there's a red box around the part you have to figure out, and there's four different colors in that part. Well, hopefully you're not colorblind as well. On top of that, the colors printed were apparently a little bit off to begin with, so even if you picked the right color, the game might still tell you it's wrong. And then it's back to trying to guess if you're clicking on the right shape at all. Of course, you probably figured out the biggest flaw. If you're one of the 10.5 million men in America with red, green color blindness, and you happen to like James Bond, it's tough shit. This game is unplayable for you. <laughs> yeah, the colors are, like, really bad. Like, they're really bad. And if you're colorblind, you're just not gonna get it right. Also, what the fuck does any of this have to do with James Bond? At least the makers of Star Traffic's made an effort to use something related to the plot of the game. But yeah. Bond solves problems by shooting and screwing things, not looking at pictures until his eyes bleed. Could have at least been a picture of some ample bows of ridiculous thing in the mix, is their point. Uh, Bioshock locks you out of your game with no recourse. Uh, I... Is that the PC version specifically? Uh, can only be downloaded to a computer only twice ever. Oh, that shit. Yeah, yeah. Spore did that as well. They, I think they did three, but like, yeah, it did not give you the, the option to download it more than those three times. Anti-piracy protection makes Spore the most pirated game of the year. Hey. <laughs> Hey, Dad, I'm ahead of the dang article. Long. This is a cr I, this is a cracked article, week. right? Yep. Yeah, I, I I vaguely remember reading it a few years ago. I'm I'm gonna say, ooh, let's see if I can guess what year that came out. Uh, 2009. Uh, let's see. Cause I don't know. I didn't look at that shit. <laughs> well, I just I I started reading it in 2009, so I that I think that was a pretty early one that I read. Oh, so, you think that's 2009? I, I'm gonna say it came out in 2009. Uh, you're only off by five years. Uh, 2014. Damn it. Honestly, that'd be a fun game. Just we each pick <laughs> cracked articles and, like, say the title, say maybe the list of entries is hints, and then... And then see who can guess the year. Yeah. Yeah. And, as a bonus, who could guess the writer? Oh, sure. Uh, I, I honestly, I don't think I know any of their current writers, because after they got oh, rid of all those senior senior writers... Oh, wait. The one, one the one who had that YouTube channel? Uh, no. Which one is this you're talking about? Uh, I'm gonna... Uh, would initials be too much of a giveaway? Because I think no, I know who I, you're talking about. Here, I'll tell you on a private chat who I'm talking about. Because I remember that that uh, one of them had a pretty bad scandal. Uh, well, the editor in chief that used to work there did. Oh, um, I never heard about that. Yes, you did, because he went to. Uh, uh, well, one over two just said it anyway, Sean Baby. Oh, Sean Baby. Yeah. Oh, okay, uh, that's not who I was thinking of. Uh, I was, somebody found, like, some old, uh, video game magazines from, like, early 2000s. I was gonna say, yeah, he was, like, he's, like, was one of the longest working writers on there. Not he necessarily still shows four. Up every now and then. He still pops up every now and then. Okay. Um, but somebody found, like, yeah, and they weren't, like, doing it to, like, out him at all. They were showing how, like, crappy writing at that time was in like, journalism. Right. And, and he went to like a con or something. And they like shared pages from a bunch of writers. They were not targeting any one person or naming anyone by name. I just happened to immediately recognize his uh, writing and his face and his name. Right. I was like, okay, well, this one's got to be, like, the one good one in the thing. And then I read the art article he'd written, and it was just the grossest thing I had ever seen. And then you look 
okay, he's cracked stuff. You're like, I guess he's gotten a little better. A I... little bit. But, like, I can't look at it now. Like, now that he's a parent, I'm like, maybe he's mellowed out. But I can't unsee what he wrote. That's the thing. That is a good point, though, is that, like, so much of writing, when you're writing for magazines or the holistical style magazine, and I'm sure, you, like, I don't have to tell you, but for the viewers at least, is, like, matching the brand that you were writing for and matching the, the tone that they want to go for. So, yeah, on one hand, if he was writing for a magazine that had some gross content, like, I'm not shocked, but also it's your responsibility as an artist working freelance to not take on jobs that you would disagree with. So either that's A, at best that's irresponsible, and at worst that's not something he disagrees with, which is, ugh. yeah, not not great. Like, yeah, yeah, not, like, that's why I walked away from Modern Road when I was writing for them. Yeah, yeah, oh, that's, uh, that's the reason that guy... That's who I yeah. thought you were talking about, but I guess he's probably John not Cheese. going up. Yep. No, no, no. Old Jonathan. So John Cheese was editor in chief at Crack before all the layoffs came, like a couple years ago. Oh, okay. I thought you were talking about Jack O'Brien. I didn't realize uh, John was an editor in chief. No, no, no. He was one of the. Well, I, I had stopped editors. reading at that point. But so. he was one of the top editors, right? Uh, one over two says hard not to think about. Uh, Hard to know what to think about of what people have done so far in the past. It's it's uh, difficult. Honestly. I yeah. that's the thing is that like uh, you can make amends because to be honest, the general like consensus towards a lot of different things have greatly changed in just the last decade. Like you can see a lot of politicians who are now currently very very much in support of LGBT rights were vehemently against them. Not yeah. not but in 2013. What? Say that word again? They were what against them? Vehemently? Vehemently? I, I said what I said. But, uh, I don't know. I don't know which is right, honestly. Vehemently. And I should. I fucking talk for a living. Vehemently? But, uh, I don't think that's vehemently. ever come up in a script I've had to do for a client, huh? So, um, what happened was... He worked for Cracked and got fired. Like, with everyone else at the same time. Uh, Daniel O'Brien and everyone else. So, uh, Brian Rushwood was like, well, why don't you come and we'll do basically the same stuff over on our website and you can be our editor in chief there. And so they brought him on as editor in chief. And Which that's seems, fine. Which seems like a perfect fit. He definitely has the, the right tone for the brand right. until so, we found out originally, about originally all the writers were you know former cracked folks were people that he could vouch for so when they opened up submissions for new writers i jumped on it and had two of my articles published um, the first one was heavily edited to because i was like i don't know how much they want me to put in here versus how much they want me to be because my articles were very, uh, they're still up on, on Modern Road right now. They were uh, articles of stuff you could build and do at home. Yeah, very with, DIY. Yeah, they were DIY articles. I was like, I don't know if they want a step-by-step -step kind of thing or more of a look what you could do. Um, so if you want to learn any of the stuff from my articles that isn't step-by-step -step or linked somewhere, uh, just go to Instructables. That's where I get a lot of my stuff from. So regardless, uh, I'm, you know, in the middle of pitching my third article when, uh, it comes out that he was a sexual predator yeah. and used his position of power over young women writers to, uh, basically make their lives hell and blah, blah, blah. And curtail so, their careers in a lot of cases. Like, quite a few yeah. of them just never got anywhere in the writing industry because of the shit he did. And so I was like, well, this happened on Friday that this came out. I'm going to give Brian until Monday to do the right thing before I'm leaving. And I talked to my girlfriend about it. I was like, uh, you know, what, what do I do here? She was like, I think that's the right decision. Give Brian time to make the right decision. 
I mean, his family has already heard what happened. If they don't agree with that, then I don't really care for them either. Right. So... That happened, and then Monday comes, and they fire him. But they didn't fire him because it was the clearly obvious right thing to do. I mean, they may have. Mm -hmm. It may be that Brian was like, you know, this is the right thing to do, we need to fire him. But the problem is, they didn't do it. Until after Bunny and Ears cut, uh, cut ties with them. Oh. Uh, they had been partnered, you know, not in the way that, like, they worked together all the time, but, like, they were brother and sister, you know, sites, basically. And they cut ties with Modern Rogue and said, we will not be working with them anymore. And then Modern Rogue finally was like, oh, uh, we fired him. We... And so it just made it look like they only did it for the to save face and to right. Yeah, it doesn't financial reasons. does not look like it was the proper moral reason. Right. So I was like, I put out a tweet about it. I put out several tweets about it explaining why I was not going to work with them anymore. And so I uh, have it pitched an article since then because I've been focusing on getting full-time work. Uh, right. But, you know, <laughs> that's the thing, like, I would simply not write for a publication if I didn't agree with what they are doing or stood for. Exactly. Um, that's your yeah. responsibility. Like, I've, I've had to do the same thing with voiceover. I've, I've checked into people, I've double-checked that the script is not something that offends me. I've had many scripts that are pretty, pretty awful, in my opinion. Some, I, I've had a few scripts for the, um, uh, how would you describe them? They're like the, the story t animated story time videos that are su submitted by kids. They're not submitted by kids, they're clearly written by someone in Russia. And in fact, it's been found out that most of those channels are doing that, but what I, whatever. I, I've done a few of those voiceovers for ones that were innocuous, but uh, yeah, once they asked me to do one that was really, really homophobic, I was like, nope, I'm, I'm out. Uh, I had a similar thing pitched me. It was a game somebody wanted me to write. And uh, they had the idea of the game they were going to do, all the coding and such. They just needed a writer. I was like, all right. Sure, sure. Let me see your pitch. And it was absolutely not anything I would have been okay writing for. It was a creepy... Like, I have nothing against writing sex stuff, like adult content, so I have nothing against writing an adult game. Um, this, however, was an adult game that I found, um, tasteless and creepy. Uh, the basic concept was, uh, you're reliving your high school years, you're, like, you're 30-something-year-old adult, reliving your high school years knowing everything you knew, as an adult. Oh no. And so do you go for a harem of women, of uh, students and teachers, or do you go for just that one special girl? And I'm like, that's disgusting. That's like, the thing, is there there is an anime with it's a drama anime, it's not sexual, and there are no relationships no, no romantic relationships involved that is a similar premise. That is actually really good. It's a really good reflection on um Basically, this guy is sent back in time, uh, butterfly effect style, so he's sent back into his third grade self. Uh, but um, some kids were like went missing from his third grade class back in the day, so it's like now he's trying to solve that mystery. So it's like a drama and a mystery. For a second, it almost seems like it's going to dip into some romance stuff, but that, that's curtailed pretty quick for the most part. Um, 
it, it's definitely a, th a very thin line, and that could have gone really creepy because it is effectively the same premise. The only difference is the, uh, the intent of the main character. Um, yeah, that was a sitcom. Like, when I was in high school, it was like some of that where... What was the it guy, called? I don't remember him. Like, it did not last long. Oh, the okay. The only thing I remember yeah. about it. The only thing I remember about it was the guy... Like, he goes back to, like, the early 80s when he was in high school. And, like, his marriage is on the rocks, and... I think he either used that time to make his relationship with his future wife stronger, as they were high school sweethearts, or he went after the girl that got away, like, whatever. Um, but, like, the one scene I remember is he sees his bully outside a movie theater and yells, uh, Darth Vader's Luke's father. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's rough. And, uh, like, that's the one thing I remember about the series before. But, like, let's, let's set that aside, right? Like, the, I often thought that would be really fun. Like, if I died and, like, if I had a genie wish, it would be to relive my life knowing everything I knew at the time of my death. But I would do different things. I would, like, not pursue different relationships. Because I'm at a point in my life now where, you know, that would mean different people not living anymore. Well... For me, I just I have just recognized with the maturity that like the reason those relationships didn't work out was not because of any actions that were taken. It was just incompatibility between me and the other person. We were not going to have a, a long-lasting relationship no matter what happened. So if I went back in time, I'd mostly just make better like financial decisions. One thing I would want to do is. Um like, copyright every Coldplay song that hadn't come out yet mm. before they wrote it, just so that the world never has to suffer through Coldplay. I um, liked Liv uh, La 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 Vida. Living La Vida. Is that what it was called? That one sounds kind of pretty. No, Viva La Vida. Yeah. Viva La Vida. Um, I, I hate Coldplay. Fair enough. I just, I do. Uh, I would prevent them from ever happening. Um, but I would avoid some relationships. Yeah, uh, that that would, could be a good use of the uh the, 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 the time. And like, there's a lot of things I didn't do as a teenager because I was too scared to try it. That as an adult, I would just like go for. Uh, number one, knocking the shit out of a few people that deserved it. Yeah, because as a kid, it's fucking what's gonna happen? Well, as a kid, I was like, yeah, uh, I'm in trouble. Our school had an SRO, so... SRO? Hey, student Resource Officer, a cop. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not um, familiar. So, our cop actually watched me technically assault a student in front of him, and the cop just went, move along, bench. I'm like, alright. Is that not what you're here for? I don't know. Well, like, our school had a zero tolerance on uh, assault policy, so I should have been arrested right then, but... And what makes it even crazier, it was his cousin I hit! <laughs> and so the cop was just like, move along, bitch. I'm like, okay, whatever. But, um... <sighs> I... You know... I would knock a lot more heads around back then. I would be friendlier to certain people. I would have come out of the closet a lot sooner to a specific friend. I the friendliness, yeah. I would have been a. I would have treated people a lot better. I, I was a real shithead kid. Um. So there was a kid at our school that was gay. I'm not gonna give too many details because if, if you know me enough from that time, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Mm. But I was so in the closet in high school, I didn't even fucking realize I was, like, pansexual. Like, I didn't... Like, same. I was homophobic in high school. Like, I'm gonna be honest. I, oh, yeah, same. The ver it, it was real internalized for me. Right. And so, I kept this guy at a distance because I didn't want to admit that, hey, I actually kind of like this guy. And I feel horrible about it. I've tried to reach out and apologize to him, but... And I don't blame him for not wanting to talk to me, like, at all. Like, he has every right to not accept my apology. But, you know, that doesn't mean I'm not going to feel remorse for what I did. 
Oh, so, yeah. I, I feel so, uh, not the exact same situation, but I know exactly the feeling. Yeah, so I kept him at arm's length. I might have bullied him a few times. Uh, I can't. I tried. I think. I like to think I wasn't uh, active about things, and I sure as shit know I didn't bully him over his sexuality. I can at least say that. I didn't bully but, anybody for that, but like I was definitely a bully. But honestly, the school I went to, it it was K through 12, 300 kids total. It was a tiny school, and we were kind of all assholes to every everybody. Like we all fucking hated each other, and weren't afraid to show it. So um, I you know, kept him at a distance, and I just keep thinking back to this one time where we're with a bunch of friends. And we were giving one of our friends a hard time because he had dated this girl who had a younger sister. Right. And the younger sister had a crush on him, so we're giving him a hard time for that. Because, you know, she was just young enough that it wouldn't be creepy for him to date her. Like, she was 14, he was nothing. I think he had, well, he had to be less than 18, so, like, 17. So, yeah. just a little on the... Right, 14, 17, like... Yeah, that's like right on the line. I, the, the rule yeah, I've always gone with... Creepy. The rule I've always gone with, because it, it always feels really effective, is... The older person, half their age, plus seven. Plus seven. Yeah, yeah, so 17, let's say rounding down, or rounding up, eight, nine, so... Eh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's a little, <laughs> little, little young. So you need to feel free right about now, that. My, the youngest, I'm 33, the youngest I'll do is a 22 year old, no younger, um, because I just don't have anything in fucking common with them. Like, that too, after you yeah, that's, that age, after you that's the that thing age, with you are like, closer in age to my son than you are to me, and that's, no, uh, that's where I draw the line. That's the thing is, I'll, I'll, I'll read like posts from r slash relationships and, or like r slash Emma the asshole, and like, yeah. half of the time, People get into relationships that are, like, over a decade apart, and I'm like, what do you even talk about? And how do you think um, it's cool when you have, like, this much more ex life experience over them? Yeah. So, so much more, like, financial, like, uh, 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 control over them in most cases, because people in their 30s are generally in a better position than someone in their 20s. My, my girlfriend is five years younger than me. Um, my oldest partner was five years older than me, uh, my son's mom. I was 18, she was mid-20s, and that was not a smart relationship for me. But, uh, going back to the car thing, we're in the car making fun of the guy, right. and the guy that I was, you know, the guy who eventually came out as gay that I secretly liked said, Andrew, I wouldn't go making fun of him too much. I know somebody in this group that has a crush on you. And I'm like, who could it be? And I, like, ran down all the girls in our group that weren't my sister. It was like four girls. Uh, it was, it was like four girls. Three of them were the sisters we were talking about, so I knew it wasn't one of them. Right. And then there was just like this quiet girl who was like 12 at the time, and I was like 16. I was like, well, it sure as shit ain't her, that's just creepy otherwise. I mean... And, and like, at the time, I noticed he kind of gave me this really forlorn look while he said it. And I thought nothing of it, right? Like, I was just like... I thought it was a... I, you know, kind of a... I wouldn't be talking shit in face, but, like, I look back at it now, I'm like, no, he was... There was, like, a look in his eye, and I'm like, was it him? Cause he didn't say, I know a girl in this group. And I was like, fuck, did I fucking... Oh yeah, that, that happens all the time. Honestly, like, just thinking back on interactions with people of the same sex back oh. when I, I had no idea about myself. I'm just like, oh, that was flirt. There's like a really good comic that goes around Twitter where it's like two girls and yeah, one of them laughs and one. yeah one of them laughs and the other one's like i like making you laugh your laugh is cute and she's like haha thanks and the other one's blushing and then it uh -huh. shows that it's just a thought bubble and it's a memory and she's just like hey wait my uh, 
I, oh, I saw a different one where it's two girls texting. And they're like, I'm looking for a girlfriend right now. And then one's like, oh really, so am I. And then the next two panels is just them staring at their phones. <laughs> uh, like, but like, I think that was the only like instance of something like that with a gay guy. With like a, a male partner, LGBT partner of any kind. But I've had like a lot of girls tell me over the years, hey, you know, I tried flirting with you in high school. I was like, no, you didn't, because I can't tell. Same. I'm like, so oblivious. Like, unless you were, like, you could have the guy on a runway with the little flashlights guiding the planes, pointing at a sign that says they're flirting with you, and I would still be like, but are they though? Sure about that. Like, right. And I didn't realize that so many people thought I was just too cool for them. You've met me. Let that phrase sink in. Yeah. People have told me they thought I was too cool for them because I was so aloof and, you know, all throughout high school. And I was like, what are you talking about? And they're like, I flirted with you all the time. And you have. And first of all, first of all, there has been a conversation that happened way more often than I care to admit because I am. You've met me. I am not an attractive guy. Like, I'm not ugly. Like, I'm not saying that. But, like, I am not, like... Like, I am a five at best. At best. Like, if you've been drinking, I'm lucky to get that high, right? Like, I'm not a water, but I am not a ten. So, for all these people who have been flirting with me, I'm like, wow, I must have had a better personality back then. But, like... Cause I just didn't know, like, I had no idea that I was so desirable in high school. And so, um, people told me, like, later, and I was like, holy shit, I had no idea. Like, all these people were flirting with me, and I just did not know, and they, like, pointed out, like, the things they did, and I'm like, oh, that is flirting. Right, and I didn't respond. I did eventually uh, re meet up with someone like that from high school, and um, she was like, I can't, I'm not gonna tell this whole story, because, uh, I, let's just say that we um, reconnected. We're reacquainted. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was really neat to, like, find out that, like, no, the reason you were alone for four fucking years is because you're just too stupid to fucking notice when people are hitting on you. You're too stupid to date. <laughs> God, this is my seventh time fighting this boss. So, uh, I'm just gonna send that to you so you can get the full story. Mm. <laughs> uh -oh. And I knew it, too. Woo. <laughs> like, I willingly did that. And, oh, I should also say... Uh, I mean, yeah, but presumably it wouldn't be exactly an interesting fact uh, <laughs> otherwise. Yeah, they, yeah, so, I mean, it's on a scale of, like, horrible things to do. I, my part in it, a five. Her part in it, a ten. I, I would say, yeah, like, there's some blame on your side, but certainly more on hers. Actually, I'm gonna point out one detail that will bring both our scores down to where I'm at a zero. So... Oh. Well, yeah. Like, it brings mine down to a lower zero, but, you know, it, it, it brings it down to zero, but on the surface, tens. Um, or at least a ten. Right. Um, but yeah. So, and, like, another girl I dated was, uh, and a girl I met in high school. And the story here is funnier. Um, and I have a lot of fun. 
funny stories involving this particular girl. Uh, I met her while trying oh, to hook up. Down to the last fucking patch on this son of a bitch. I met her while trying to hook up with her best friend because, uh, A, she had a boyfriend at the time and her best friend was single, and I had a huge crush on her best friend. Right. Uh, her, her best friend was like, one of the earliest. Like, I'd seen attractive people before, but I had never seen anyone that literally, like, took my breath away and made me go, oh my uh, god. Got it. It's, so, uh, like, she literally was just like that person where I was like, oh my god, that's. Oh, that. That was magic, right? So, a couple of years later, I'm working at Walmart, and the friend that I was not trying to hook up with came in. And was telling me, oh, I just broke up with my boyfriend, actually. You know, this, that, and the other. I'm like, oh, really? And she's like, you know, I always had a huge crush on you in high school. I was like, you didn't We argued every time we talked in high school. And she was like, yeah, well, that's because I had a boyfriend and I didn't want to, I was jealous that you were hitting on my friend and instead of me and I had a crush on you. And I was like, okay, well then. So we wound up dating uh, for off and on for like a year or two. And then um, she recently was going to get married and needed a officiant for her wedding because she was a Christian and her fiancé was a Muslim and no one in our small town on either side was willing to perform the ceremony. Oof. And I don't know if you know this, but technically speaking, I'm allowed to do weddings mm -hmm. because I am an ordained preacher. Uh, and here's the fun thing, I can change my title at whim, because it doesn't really matter, so I go with reverend when I want to sound pompous and important, but I go with preacher because I love, uh, the T show the same name featuring, uh, Dominic Cooper. Mm. Um, so I'm ordained, I can legally perform weddings, so I joked and said, well, you know, if you need someone, I'll do it. And she was like, I am not getting my ex-boyfriend high school crush to perform my wedding to a Muslim. <laughs> Do you know how white trash that makes me feel right now? <laughs> and, I'm like, and I was like, hey, I don't know why you're like pointing that detail out. Like, you're just getting married as far as I'm concerned and you're having a hard time getting an affection. None of the rest of that's important to me. But um, she was like... The only way that it could make her dad angry, because her dad loved me and did not quite like her fiance. She's like, the only way you being a part of my wedding could make him angrier is if it was my ex that I was marrying yeah. instead of uh, the fiance or me. And she, I was like, that would be fucking great. I would do that wedding in a heartbeat. And she was like, I'm not having you do the wedding. So, fast forward a couple months, and she could find no one else, so I wound up doing the officiating, <laughs> officiating of her wedding. Nice. And she said, you know, if you had told me in high school that you would marry me one day, I would have been excited. If I had known that this is what you meant, I would have been livid. <laughs> <laughs> This tech is one of those fun things I can do is buff and like what was really great, I worked for Family Dollar before that, before I did the wedding. And her mom was actually the manager at the one in our town. Mm -hmm. And I was working at the one uh town away. I had to drive actually two towns away. And she was like, Why aren't you working for me? I was like, because they hired me. <laughs> And she was like, do you want to work closer to home? I was like, yeah. So they transferred me. And when I started there, they had a, I don't know if you know much about working small retail, like Dollar Tree or Family Dollar or Dollar General. Not much. But, so the truck of inventory comes in on Thursday. And you have to have it all out by Sunday night. Like, if it was on the truck, it needs to be on the floor or it needs to be overstock it has to be processed and out sunday night 
So they had a backlog of that stuff. I started there in like January, or no, not January, it was right. They had over a year's backlog. We'll just put it that And they, it was so bad they had to hire two workers whose job it was to just put out stock. That's all they did. Um, that's strange for one of those companies because what they really do is on any given day, there's a manager and a cashier, unless it's a super busy store. Right. And that's it. That's all that you've got in the whole store. Oh yeah, anytime I go in, it, I'm lucky to see more than a single cashier. Right, because they can't really afford to run both registers, unless it's Christmas or a very heavily trafficked store. So, the manager is to clean and stock the ha back half of the store. The cashier is to clean and, you know, maintain the front half of the store. Uh, so... Depending on the layout of your store, that for me meant uh, groceries and a section of health and beauty and a row of clothing. <laughs> and that's all I was supposed to stock, you know, that's all my job was, was to put that out. So, these guys have been working there for months and couldn't get the backlog down. Within, within two weeks of me working there, we had not only caught up, we stayed caught up, and their jobs became redundant, and they had to be fired. Ooh. And one of their moms came in and looked daggers at me while she was dropping him off to get his last check. And I'm like, what did I do? I did my job. That's and the problem. Half of the time with jobs like that. Yeah. yeah. Half of the like time with jobs like that. Behind. Sometimes laziness is just meant as a way to, like, to, for longevity, honestly. Yeah. And what's sad is if they had done their jobs better, they would have been transferred to another store. Oh, yeah. But they probably like didn't want to do actual work. They just wanted to hang out and do slow stocking all day. Basically. But the thing is, like, that's still with two cashiers that rotate throughout the week, two assistant managers and a manager. These, and they still couldn't catch up. But within that time of me being there, uh, I, they have what they call a Yuba, which is basically just a fancy cart. Uh, it's like a, a flatbed thing with two metal, like, loops at each end that hold everything on. Okay. And work as handlebars. Like, you, you'll know it as soon as you see one next time you go. Sure. It just looks like a, a... You'll often see, like, wrapping around them to keep the stuff on it. Um, you would get one of those, and you would unload it while running the register, and if there was a mess or a problem handling that. So it's not like it's hard to fall behind. It really is. A lot of times, you'd be finishing on Monday morning if, you know, you didn't finish Sunday night. It yeah. happens. But, um, so I would do my new boat, and I could get one of those out in an hour. Like, that was just my speed. And that was beaten into me at my other store, because that boss was tough. But, man, did he prep me for working, you know, a disaster like that. I told him, yeah, man, you ought to go down there and see what their backlog is. Well, I told him he almost died. Um, because I still went to that town because that's where my girlfriend was going to school at the time. Mm. Um, and so, you know, he was a tough and often cruel man, you know, manager, but he was never wrong. He, like, he was never, he never went too far or, uh, you know, was unfair about it. Mm -hmm. So, tough, but, you know, very fair. Right. And so, when I got that done, uh, I finished my first U-boat, and I was like, you know, standing around waiting for my boss. And after a while, I'm like, she ain't bringing me another U-boat yet. I called her to the front. I was like, you got any more work for me to do, or is that my only U-boat? 
She's like, what are you talking about? Like, I finished the other one. Bring me my next one. And she's like, you finished it? <laughs> what? And she looked over, saw it finished, was like, did you really? He goes, yeah. And she was like, oh my god, we're going to catch up. <laughs> So how long, how long were they backed up for? Like over a year. Over a year. Yeah. Wow. And so I got all of that when kids truck, like they, she rearranged the schedule to keep me there the whole weekend. I got that whole weekend's truck put away and then got a head start on the backlog by Sunday evening. And so come Monday morning, I had, you know, some time off. And they were able to start moving the backlog in. And like I said, within two weeks, we were caught up because of that. And like, it really pissed my boss off because uh, two of her assistant managers were leaving. Uh, All right. And she knew that was happening. Like, that was you know, on the books for, uh, you know, months in advance. And so she wanted me to have one of those positions because fucking I earned it. And, like, I don't ever... I try not to toot my own horn on any work I do because, like, oh, really? Wow, so cool. I try not to be that guy, so... But I earned that fucking promotion. And Family Dollar, in particular, is very vocal about how they prefer to hire from within. They don't like to hire outside people to promote from within. They don't like to hire outside people for higher positions like managers, assistant managers, or anything above. They prefer to promote their cashier so that there's, you know, working your way up kind of mentality in the store. Both of the assistant managers leave, but the first one goes first. And instead of uh, accepting my nomination for the store manager for the position, the district manager said no, and apparently just did not like me, refused to accept it, and hired from outside, which pissed off the cashiers and I at first. But in all fairness, she was a really good assistant manager, and she was a very good worker like just a good choice for the role and when the second one left the assistant or the district manager knew she couldn't get away with that twice like we'd have her head on a spike to pass up you know qualified people for the role even if it wasn't me there were other people qualified in that store and the only way she could justify not giving in to me first would be to hire from outside again. Right. So she knew she was fucked there. So she promoted me. The woman she hired from outside was making uh, eight seventy five an hour. At the time, I was making seven seventy five an hour because I was a cashier. So you would think I'd get a dollar raise. No, I got a raise up to eight dollars. Oh. Because the district manager didn't want to give me the full raise. And my store manager, who again is my ex-girlfriend's mom, who loves me at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, the district manager couldn't remember what it was going to be. And so my girlfriend's mom goes, oh, he was going to get 850. Mm -hmm. And the district manager went with it and gave me the 50 cent raise. All right. So my mm -hmm. boss got me extra money and I'm like, good for you. Thank mm -hmm. you. And, yeah, I'm still friends with her family today. I still love her family. They're, you know, good friends of mine. And I'm lucky that my girlfriend is the kind that does not tell me I can't be friends with exes because I've been friends with her since, you know, it was like, oh my god, we were friends four years before we started dating. Which is the only time I've ever dated a friend like that. Right. And, you know, it went fine, but it's not something I would do again. Yeah. Um, not because of bad man, it's just, I don't want all my friends to know I have a little dick. So, yeah. It's just not something. I mean, uh, that I 
have funny foot odor. Yo, yo. Ah, yeah. That's what I meant to say. What was the first thing you said? Funny foot odor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you just said that twice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just sounded funny because of the impression on the microphone over the internet. Right, 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 right. I, I've been lucky enough that I've never had... A, a, I, I've only had one real ridiculous job, but um, I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna take a break and get some water, but I, I will tell you all about that when I get back here, so. Um, right. I, I have lists of terrible jobs. Oh, yeah. I, I've got stories. Oh, yeah. Let's uh, get into that in just a minute. BRB. And I'll leave, I'll leave the mic on so that you can entertain the folks, Andrew. While Iggy's gone, um, one of the worst jobs I've had, one of the worst jobs I've had is, uh, window factory. Like, the people were fine, everything was mostly okay, but you never think about windows as being heavy, but they are. And, uh... When I worked there, my job was hefting the finished product around onto carts, after which they would just be rolled around. So I'm literally the only person in the whole fucking factory that has to pick up these big heavy things and carry them. And they could be, you know, 8 feet wide and 12 feet tall, so you're stretching your arms as best you can. Um, they could be, you know, over 100 pounds. The smallest ones are like 20, and those are, you know, pretty fucking big too. Um, and ever since then, I've been in like constant pain. Like my back shot, my knees are shot, uh, all that. I've worked from there. So, started at Dollar General, Arby's, Window Factory, with a one week period where I did construction. Uh, left the window factory for Walmart, left Walmart for newspaper delivery, which I did for three fucking years. And it's so awful. If you get a newspaper, fucking pay your delivery guy, please. That money doesn't go to the company, it goes to him or her. And if you're not paying, they're suffering. Um, went from that to delivering medicine for a pharmacy to nursing homes, care homes, and the like. Went from there to the Family Dollar. Went from Family Dollar to a metal factory where we made like displays and shit for stores. Like if you ever seen one of those rotating racks full of postcards made of metal, I probably worked with that. Where my job was rearranging hooks for the paint line. And the way the paint line worked was it was electromagnetic paint. Uh, the item was charged positively and the paint came out in a powder called a powder coat that was charged negatively. Static electricity to bring them together and then it would go into an oven where it would bake and become a coating. Now what makes that so interesting is for that to work the hooks are also getting painted but they have to be cleaned and the easiest way to do that was to take them all and burn them. And the reason they have to be clean is if they're not making metal to metal contact with the part going through the paint line, then they would not be imparting its charge to the item and the powder would just fall off like baby powder on uh, plastic ball. So, you would take these hooks at the end of the week and you'd throw them in this giant industrial oven while stacking them like lightning logs and setting them on fire. And then you covered with ashes. And so I'm dealing with these ash covered uh, hooks all the time. I'm dirty. Another trick if you needed them immediately. My favorite was to lay the hook on a metal anvil and hit it with a hammer, and the powder coat would just be so thick it would break off. Or you would use a little uh, drill with a grinding bit in it. You would just. And you know, clear it out. And so I was just filthy and arranging these hooks all the time. And I realized, like, on the ride home, like, it was a 40 hour a week job. You would work 10 hours a day and have Friday off. 
And if you've never worked a 10 hour factory job in the North Carolina heat summer, you might not know just how fucking awful it was. I would come home, I would get up at the crack of dawn, go to work. I would get off work, get home, take a shower, go straight to bed. Because there's no, like, energy or time for anything else. Uh, my girlfriend barely, I barely ate, like, I rarely ate. Because you're just working all the time. Um, luckily, we knew we were leaving for Georgia shortly after that, so it wasn't awful. And my boss was great. But, you know, I realized I was right home one time. I was dirty. I had been arranging hooks all day. I was filthy. And I could finally hold my head high and say, I was a dirty, filthy hooker. <laughs> That was a long way to go for that punchline. I was going to say, yeah. I'm back, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, and then, um, the last job I had after that before becoming a writer was a uh, dishwasher at a university kitchen. Oh, yeah. I think you might have even and gone into that a, on a stream, but yeah, well, since we're on the topic. In case I haven't, I worked for a professional kitchen, like a chef and everything, like a head chef. And everything, like, big time kitchen. And so, I had applied to be a cashier at one store, because it was a university, the company covered the whole campus, and the campus covered the entire town. Um, so, I had applied to be at one store within walking distance of my apartment at the time, and that's the job they hired me for. So, they give me some paperwork and said, or a letter to say, oh, you gotta come fill out some paperwork at this location. And I'm like, oh, that's where the main headquarters is. That makes sense. So I go over there, and then they start giving me a tour of that location. And I'm like, well, that's weird. Why would they give me a tour of this location? I don't, I'm not gonna work here. And they're like, oh, in case we hadn't pointed out yet, uh, you'll be working here. And I was like, oh, uh, I will, I applied at the other one, you know, because it was within walking distance of my home. I'd have to drive to get here every day. And they're like, oh, it's fine, it's fine, we provide parking. And I'm like, okay, but that's not what I said. Mm -hmm. I said, I, you know, whatever, fine. And so I'm like, wait for them to show me the front area where the cashier sits, checking cards and whatnot. And they keep showing me the back, and I'm like, okay. And then they show me the dishwashing station and say, this is where you'll be working. I was like, um, are you sure you guys have the right resume? I applied to be a cashier at the other location. Has there been a mix-up or something? And they said, oh, no, we just need a dishwasher here. And so that's the job we have for you. I'm like, but that's not the job you offered me or promised me. Mm -hmm. So that should have been my first red flag. I quit that job within a week and went back to school instead because it was so poorly run. Yeah. Like, I've never quit a job due to mismanagement. I've quit jobs because I had other jobs or because I had to move. But I never quit a job due to mismanagement until that job. That job was so bad I went back to college. Yeah, that's pretty much the story of uh, my only... I mean, okay, I guess I had two bad jobs, but one is such like a... A nothing that it didn't matter but I, I worked for a short time as a canvasser for um grassroots something or other it's I, I found out since that it's it's a it's a garbage company because like they they basically canvas to get donations for causes and like when I was working for them they were doing it for the Southern Poverty Law Center cool except because they are for-profit not only do, can they keep their books closed but they do not have to give any of that money back to Southern Poverty Law Center so, it, it already sucked to be asking for donations on the street from people who certainly were not interested, but on top of that, like, the fact that it was just scummy. But that's, that, that, 
th that was its whole thing. I just didn't meet quota because the quotas were nigh impossible to fucking meet. Um. Uh, I feel like I had a job with quotas one time, and I just can't remember what it was. Mm -hmm. Um. I did sales. Oh. Uh, I got accidentally involved in a pyramid scheme company. Oh no. An, so an MLM or something? Yeah, it was, um, some of you may have heard of these, uh, may have heard of the company, even you might have gotten a letter yourself, from Vector, hmm. um, selling Cutco knives. Cutco, that's the, that's the big one, yep. Yep, so I was 18, but I had already graduated, I was working at, graduated high school, I should say, I was working at Dollar General. I was dating my son's mom at the time, and I wanted extra money, you know, so I could move out with her and have our own place. And so I was like, well, you know, this company sounds like, you know, door-to-door -door sales, but that's fine, I don't mind that. No. And for those of you who don't know, Vector works by taking young people, mostly, and telling them, oh, you can make so much money selling these high-quality knives. Now, I will say this. They are very good knives. They're not eighteen hundred dollars for a set good, but they are good. Yeah, which is a I, hard sell for yeah. for a person you've just met. Right, and so there's a kit, there's a script, there's all kinds of shit involved in that thing. Mm -hmm. But they are good knives. The thing is, I could take you to a decent department store, like a you know Sears or something and get you a set of knives that are just as good and then a knife sharpener that works really well i need to send you a link to that i'm sorry uh, oh that's right yeah i was gonna look for uh, that later but uh yeah yeah um get you a decent knife sharpener and i can guarantee you cut cut and i can show you how to use it properly um that's the thing like knowing how to use a knife sharpener is important yeah um, so what you do is, I can take you and give you that, show you how to use it, and you'd be set for the rest of your life, because yeah. you know what to look for and what to use. Um, my big thing, I do not like at all using wooden kitchen utensils. No. No wooden spoons, no wooden handled knives, no wooden cutting boards. At all. Not for me. Not my thing. That's fine. Also, if, if I'm cooking something like vegetarian or like a tomato sauce, I will use like a wooden spoon, but for the most part, it's just not sanitary. Right. The most unsanitary thing I will use, because I can throw it in a fucking washing machine, is a cut glove. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I can throw it in a washing machine when it gets all chickeny and nasty, and then you know wash it. Uh, what do you use? The... What do you use for uh, uh, oven mitt? Just like an oven glove, or? No, you've seen our funky oven mitts. They're uh, silicone. Oh yeah, those things. With the individual fingers. Right. Yeah. Uh, oh, that I, could be a way to go. I just have like an of glove, but it, it's machine washable, but it's, uh, yeah, it's gone pretty ratty at this point. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I can send you the brand for those. Uh, mm -hmm. it's Alcom. Okay. A-O. Uh, I'll send it to you, but it's Alcom. A-O-C-O-M-E. And every time I see the brand for the, for the oven mitt, my first thought is, uh, like, cockney British accent asking why I can't help them with the chores. Like, how come you always put... Like, I can't unsee that. Right? Uh, right. there's a lot of brands for this particular knife sharpener. I don't know what ours is, but... I would find one that has, like, the best, uh, like, reviews and, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, 
rating? Rating, yeah. Like, best brand recognition, I guess. Because the way this works is you see a little, like, uh, pointy thing pointing upwards at the top. That is a handle, and you, the bottom of that black ring is actually a suction cup. You put that on a smooth surface and push that pointy thing down, and it lifts uh, the cup and suctions it to your table. And you just shh, shh, shh. And I swear, I've, I will swear by it as the best. I don't like serrated knives. But they are a necessity for some things. So, um, I only use them for bread, for, uh, extremely tough steaks. Right. And that's it. And I don't use the same one of each for that. Like, I have a steak knife, and I have a bread knife. Because the serrated knives are much, much harder to sharpen. Right. Um, they're extremely fucking complicated to sharpen. More or less, either have to hire a professional or send it back to the factory. Yeah, I've seen, uh, like, you can get the sharpener with, like, a rod on it, but it's like, I don't... I, I don't think I'd be able to manage the right angle for, like, consistently enough to be able to do that. Right. Also, if you look at, uh, TV Chef, you see he's got that big metal rod and he's running it up and down the sides of his knife blade. That is not a sharpener. That is a honing steel. Yes. And what it does is, even if it's not a serrated knife, if you look at the edge of the blade under a microscope, uh, I don't know what magnification you need, but you look at it, and it will look like the seeth of a saw. Mm -hmm. Why, er, and when the knife is honed, which is what that honing steel is for, honing, when it is honed, all the teeth line up like they should. But if you're chopping roughly with it, or if you're using it for something that it's not meant for, like uh, cutting through bone or something, or particularly hardened fruit, or you know, using it on a stone or glass cutting board, the teeth get bent out of the way. They're misaligned. The honing steel just knocks them back into alignment. If they are not sharp, you need to sharpen it. That is separate from honing. And you should, you should hone your knives before you sharpen them. Yeah. And you should really be um, honing your knives before right, each right. use. Yeah. Um, and it's real easy. Like, just quick. One, two, three, one, two, three, two, two, one, one. Slice it down each way, about a 20 degree angle. It doesn't have to be that exact for a hone pretty much does it i mean honestly if you know how to tell how sharp a knife is like just do it until it feels sharp again effectively so like y you should just take the time and learn how to actually tell when a knife is sharp so that you can tell what kind of edge you want to uh use for chopping or whatever you're using it for Proper knife maintenance and care can be like the biggest thing in the world. It can make all the difference in the quality of your knives. And I don't care how good your knife skills are. I love using a cut glove with my non-cutting hand. Hmm. Because, like, even if you think you can't cut yourself, you can. Yeah. I cut myself on tongs we talked about on the stream before. Yeah. <laughs> So you can cut yourself on a knife, no matter how good you are. There's always going to be that one day where you're just not on your game like you think you are. Yeah. And it happens to everyone. I, you know, so I wear the glove. But beyond that, it also gives you traction on food. Exactly. Especially slippery food like chicken breast, olives, um, garlic cloves. You get traction in your grip with that arm. So not only are you holding it better, that means you've got better slices anyway. Because now you can slice it 
thinner and thinner because it's not slipping and sliding underneath you. Right. And so it's just better all around. Here's a weird little kitchen hack. Wait, speaking of your garlic. Mm -hmm. This actually works. Do not buy the uh, device made for this. But if you've got a stainless steel spoon or fork with a good bit of heft to it, like, no, no heft is fine. Butter knife is best because they usually have the thickest handle. Oh, yeah. Uh, get If you've been cutting garlic or onions and you want to get the smell off your hands, wash your hands and use the butter knife as a uh, soap. And rub it all over your hands. And, like, in between your fingers, use it the way like you see people in uh, some weird people who use the bar to wash themselves in a shower commercial. Like, right. you don't have a washcloth, do that with the uh, butter knife. The handle, specifically. Get all over your hands, and the smell will be gone. Completely. No smell. And mm -hmm. it works. Like, and apparently if you buy, like, the... They sell bars of soap made of stainless steel to help with I've that. seen those, yeah. It is just a lump of stainless steel. Yeah, uh, they apparently don't work as well. Really? Is it like yeah. a coating or something? What I think it is, mm -hmm. is they, the soap bars are hollow. Mm. And I, I just have this weird feeling like... Because I do find it works best with a heftier butter knife or something. Or a heftier, you know, handle of a spoon. Like, if you've got thinner, you know, lighter spoons, it won't work as well. Right. And I also find that the matte finish to them helps, but it's not necessary. Because a shiny surface works just as fine. But it just gets rid of the smell. I should test that with fish. Oh, yeah. See if it gets a fishy smell out, because... If, but I do feel like... Man, you could make it not shaped like a bar of soap. Like, make it a... Make it like a hotel soap instead, so that it's got the necessary mass. I honestly believe that's somehow connected. Right. Because it just seems like it's an important aspect. Like, yeah, I'd like to see, like, a... a America's Test Kitchen or something, like, actually see what the science behind that is. I would too. Um, man, I haven't listened to America's Test Kitchen in so fucking long. Yeah. Back when I was delivering newspapers, man. Uh, that would have been years and years and years ago. Uh, God, it would have been... Maddie and I have been together for almost ten years now. We got wow. together in 2011. Uh, yeah, so from 2011 to now, that would have been... So I haven't listened to America's Test Kitchen in about 10 or 11 years. Um, I used to deliver newspapers, which I did for three fucking years, and I've told stories about that before, but uh, it's what you would do is on Saturday, you would listen to NPR, because you get tired of music very quickly when you listen to radio a lot. Sure. And you start to, like, I hated every new band that came out, like, everything. So I would just listen to that, you know, talk radio all day. And right. so I would listen to, like, the Bob and Tom show in the morning, switch over to NPR in the afternoon. And that mostly meant listening to a lot of politics that, at the time, were, like, weighing heavy on me and stressed me out, but, like, not yeah, nearly as bad as today. But, uh, like, it was the beginning of the Obama presidency. Like, I remember delivering the newspaper with him waiting on the front cover. Happily. So, uh, I remember so it was that era of NPR. And then... God, it just got to a point where it was so depressing to listen to the politics stuff. Uh, but there was nothing else to listen to, so I would find, like, lunchtime shows to cover the one hour of, uh, politics before they would go to something like, uh, 
all things considered or something. Right. And, um, Diane Ring. That's who I was avoiding. Diane Ring, so... Not always political, but man... Just wasn't what I enjoyed, you know? Right. But Saturday mornings would come along, and you would get, uh... You know, wait, wait, don't tell me. Right. Uh, says you... Uh, ask me another yep, yep. car talk. Um, you know, just some really great s comedies and stuff. And it was like a breath of fresh air, which was another show. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, they just had these amazing Saturday shows. And I had never heard anything like them. Like, I had never heard. Uh, comedy radio like the BBC still does so like the concept of that was just so foreign to me I had no idea and so these shows blew my fucking mind at the time and no I hadn't heard of podcasts yet <laughs> yeah I mean they were still pretty pretty uh, fresh as a uh, medium honestly at that point and, yeah and what's really crazy is, as somebody who listened to a lot of NPR, to listen to a lot of podcasts, I'm like, it is clear that you guys are either fans of or worked for NPR at some point. Oh, certainly. I mean, that's the, that's like the gold that's... standard of talk radio, honestly. It's because like you have that, or you have like the AM stations full of the televangelism Thanks. and such. That's yeah. just kind of corny at best. But, like, there's a lot of podcasts that you listen to, and you're like, I wonder if this podcast's goal is to get on NPR, mm. because every episode sounds like an NPR show already. Yeah. And I would look up some of these, and, like, they would have the same kind of music cues, the same kind of, uh, welcome back to NPR. Today, we are discussing the legal ramifications of, uh... Bear cramming a bird into his backpack and dunking it underwater for hours on end. Uh, uh, with me today. Wait, that's with Sigma, me. Delta, Sigma, Sigma, Pi, Omega. Okay. Okay, I gotta remember this code. Sig e, triangle, E, E, Pi, Omega. Yeah, basically. Omega. I remember Delta because it's the um, the symbol of the, the guy who made the Labyrinth of Minotaurs in... Um, and Sigma because of Mega Man X, because he's the, the main villain of that. That's, uh, and then the others are just, I mean, Pi. I don't need to go into that one. Ah, oh, crap. Nah, I put too many in there. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, Sigma. Delta. Triangle. Triangle. Okay, that counts. Uh, uh. Pi. Triangle, triangle. Uh. Or e, e, I mean. And then, ooh, actually, I think Pi. I can hit Omega from over here. Can I? Yes, and done. Kenny. And Kenny. And Kenny. Omega. So, to step back for a minute, um, you were talking about Knifeco, and honestly, Knifeco, it's it's pretty scummy. Cutco. Cutco, Cutco. yes. Sorry. Yeah. But, um... They were, were multi-level marketing. Um, exactly. They're... Although, nowadays, how multi-level marketing gets by... Because back then, it was it was effectively multi-level marketing, but the, the majority that of it was... was... Yeah. That's the thing, is for anyone who doesn't know, basically, a pyramid scheme is, um, you sell someone a product with the intent of telling them to sell it. And then the idea is that you sell it at a profit so that the further down you go, um, you will get money and then you'll get it from someone above you. So honestly, but, the only person who gets a real profit is at the top. Right, so I have a thing I'm selling. So I go to Iggy, I'm like, Iggy, I got you and your friend here. I want you two to sell this product for me. And then your two job is to get two more people to sell for you, because then you get a cut of their profits, and then on down the line, each one getting two, each one getting two, and the, 
person at the top, you know, is getting cuts of all the profits. And the, you know, further up the chain you are, the more of a cut you get. And it's unethical. It's illegal, I think, for the most part. But yeah, it's well, okay, a pyramid scheme is certainly illegal. Multi-level marketing, they get around it because they are effectively a pyramid scheme, but they, uh, because they are not directly selling you a product, they're selling you a membership, and they're selling you work supplies, that, that's technically not a pyramid scheme. Immediately fucked that up. I'm, I'm just gonna skip crispy bacon. Honestly, I can't stand this fucking challenge. So yeah, uh, I almost was suckered into an MLM, but like they they did the whole um, uh, they did the whole presentation. They had like a little conference room at like a, a tiny hotel. It was like a days in or something, and they did the whole presentation. And they we all went out for pizza after that, and they like bought me dinner and stuff. And I was like, hmm, maybe. And then it's like, 185 bucks for this. And I'm like, I don't even have that. And even if I did, none of the shit that you were giving me is worth that. Yeah, I did it for one weekend. Mm-hmm. And felt so guilty selling my pastor's wife a $75 butter knife. Yeesh. That I gave her her money back and said, I can't do this. It's wrong. And I returned my equipment and you know, got a three hundred dollar paycheck two weeks later, which was twice what I was making at Dollar General at the time. Right. And I was like, oh damn, how much is my soul worth? Because here's mm -hmm. the thing, you don't get paid for like they're very cruel about this. Hmm. You get paid a base amount for doing the presentation that you're taught, right. which takes a week to learn. But you're paid, you know, seventy dollars a piece for every time you do that. Okay. But here's the thing: if I sell to you, Iggy, after you see my presentation, and you're like, I'd like to get more of these wonderful knives, and you contact me again. I don't get that $70 anymore because you've already seen the presentation. Mm. So if you drive me out to your house and you decide not to buy anything that time, I'm fucked out luck. Like, I don't get paid for my time. I don't get paid for That's such you know, anything. nonsense. That was right. the thing with the thing they tried to sucker me into. It was like, it was basically like subscription legal services or something. I don't remember, but it was... Uh, whoops, fuck that up. Um, but basically, the idea, uh, the idea was that um, you didn't get paid unless you made a sale, and the sale was more of the shit that you bought. So it was actively just a pyramid scheme. But because they were doing, it was a membership, and it was a kit for you to do your work. They it got away with it for the most part. I mean, honestly, a lot of them get shut down once the people catch on to them, so they basically want to sucker as many people as they can yeah. before they get caught. It was... It just felt unethical from the get-go. And what's oh, yeah. crazy is, I actually could have sold the shit out of it, because I'm stupidly good at selling shit. Um, and I don't mean, like, Oh, boy. When I worked for Family Dollar, I upsold people. Now, I was ethical about it, though. I only upsold people if I knew we had a better product on the shelf. Yeah. And didn't want them to walk away with something that was crap. Because it was cheap. Because, like, we had a guy that would come in every week and buy, like, a 24-pack of batteries. Oh, damn. Like, the... Yeah, and I'm like, bruh. I like my first thought was this guy drug something, right? And I'm like doing the math. I'm like, I, I can't figure out what you're doing with 24 batteries at a time. It's drug related. Like, it's not like Tide, which is which can be used for drugs. Like, uh, you trade it for drugs. Right. Um. There's no, as far as I know, no battery underground. And like, you know, you're buying like 24 batteries a week. 
Yeah, what, how, what so, could possibly be ripping through those so fast? Right, and I'm just like, I can't piece it together. Does he play in, like, the Sega Game Gear, or what? Like, yeah. And so... That thing yeah, took, like, week, eight batteries, right? I yeah, something like that. But he came in one week, and I was like, you know, how much have you spent on batteries this year alone? And he was like, probably something like, you know, $200. And I'm like... Yeah. Let me show you something we got. And I showed him our rechargeable batteries. And that dude fell in love with me from that point. Like, he was like, man, I use those batteries every week. I tell you what, man, I've never seen such a thing. Thank you, man. Thank you. And he bragged. Like, every time he saw the manager, he was like, get that boy a raise. <laughs> so, nice. Yeah, and my manager, you know, was absolutely happy that I'm selling, you know, the better product. Like, getting people to buy the more expensive thing. But, like, I'm only doing it because it saved that dude money over the long that's, run. That's always the thing is like, the more expensive thing is always going to be in the long run cheaper. Like there, there's the famous uh, Terry Pratchett uh, breakdown of it from Discworld where it's like, uh, a poor man will buy boots, will buy a two, two gold pair of boots and it'll last him about a month before the cardboard wears through and he can tell what part of the city he's in by the feel of cobblestones on his toes. But a rich man will buy a 10, or no, like a 50 gold pair of boots. And while, yeah, that's more expensive, those will last him a decade. Right. So, like, in the end, this is a lot cheaper. Yeah, but, you know... It, it costs money to be poor, basically. But exactly, yeah. You can't buy in bulk or buy any of the good shit that will last. No, no. That, that's off the table. Yeah. Um, so to take it back even further in our conversation, the worst job I ever had, like, obviously Grassroots sucked, because, I mean, I was only there for like a month. But the worst one I had was this fucking tiny movie theater chain in uh, uh, Western Washington. It was north of Seattle. I think it was Landmark Movie Theaters. Something. They've probably changed their name by now because it was a garbage fire of a movie company. Um, but yeah, they basically bought up any movie theater that was remote enough in like a small enough town that one of the big chains wouldn't want it. And they, uh, they would just do a shitty job with it. It was terrible management. And effectively, like, when I went up, because at the time I was living with my grandmother who lived in a small town in Washington. And um, it, it was one of the places to work in town. So I was, because she went there all the time and she knew the staff, she was like, oh, come, you come in. I know the manager will get you a job right away. It was like the day I moved in with her. And I was like, okay, let's do this went in and they were like, yeah, we, you have like experience. You worked at like the busiest Starbucks in the fucking world. Um, like I, I've lived, worked at the one right by Pike's place that, uh, yeah, we would have like 50 people an hour coming through and like 50 more in the line behind them. It was madness. And so they were like, we can get you set up as a system manager right now. Um, so then you'll get good payment and all that. We just have to train you first. So you have to be trained as a standard usher concessions person. And then after that, you will be assistant manager. And I was like, okay, cool. Uh, but within while I was being trained, the person who hired me, she left to go work her better job that she had already been working for a while. And the new manager just never received the memo on that. So I ended up just doing concession stuff. I was basically consistently being trained because everybody there had been trained wrong. There was no standard. There was no, no like notarization of how we were supposed to do anything. Everybody who taught me something taught it completely differently. And when I told them about the other person, they said, well, this is how I do it. Everybody did it totally different. It was completely unorganized. It was like just nasty all the seats were torn apart everything and like by by the third manager we went through it was a lady who was like uh it, it was the wife of like the the district manager which is effectively like the vice president of the company who had her only experience was as a pharmacist she had no food service background so like she would be like She'd be like serving food with a pair of gloves and then cleaning with it 
then just taking that pair of gloves off, putting it on the counter, and then putting it back on later to serve food again. It was disgusting. And like, the, the thing that really made me just leave was when the actual like head of the company came in and she, I'd heard bad stories about her. I had heard really bad things, and I was like, it can't be that bad. Like, everybody says their boss is terrible, but most of them are just, like, actually keeping people, like, um, like, keeping account of people, but, wow, no, like, I worked one, like, movie opening with her, because it'd basically be, like, you work for, like, the 15 minutes before movie starts the 15 minutes after it starts and then it's just a couple hours of cleaning between until the movie's over um and so i worked one of those concession rushes with her and there wasn't time to talk or anything so it was just like business as usual and like as we were cleaning up after like everybody was in the movie it she i like literally tried to start a conversation with her and she just actively ignored ignored me like i literally did not even respond to a thing i said and I, try, I tried like two sentences, no response, acted like I was not even there. I'm like, okay, I'm leaving because this, this is a monster person and they're running a horrible, disgusting business. So I, I don't need to be associated with this and I don't need the money that bad. I'll find another shitty minimum wage job in this town if I can't be at least paid decently for what is considered decent here whole situation was just a fucking nightmare. There was so much stress. There was no consistency. By the time I left, it seemed like they were actually kind of getting their shit together because they brought in people to actually, like, train everybody consistently. But at that point, I was like, nah, I'm just, I'm out of here. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna deal with this anymore. Yeah. Then, then I worked at a grocery store, and that was pretty cool. It's just like a, 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 not quite the deli area, but it was like the, uh, they served like simple like teriyaki food in a deli style. That, that was all right. Yeah. Um, I worked at Arby's. I actually, to this day, still like Arby's. Um, yeah. and here's a thing that might be controversial. Arby's has the best jalapeno poppers of any restaurant, yes, even your favorite local pub-style restaurant. Oh, I've never actually tried their jalapeno poppers. I should try them next time I go by there. What's the what's the most commonly used cheese in a jalapeno popper? That'd be uh, cream cheese. You would think, but no. Cheddar. It's always cheddar everywhere I go. Everywhere. Huh. Arby's is one of the few places that actually uses cream cheese. Right. And it's better. Like, cheddar doesn't go with a pepper flavor. Like, it, no, not really. Cream cheese balances that, like, kind of sour that a jalapeno is. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit sour, a little bit, uh, kind of bitter, even. And, right. But also fruity. And, like, the cream cheese balances that better. Yeah, definitely. That's why I'm so... I, I, I don't think I've ever had a jalapeno popper with just, uh, cheddar cheese. It's always been, like, a cream or sometimes, like, a ricotta. Mm, yeah, I could say a ricotta. Here's the thing. I don't like ricotta in sweet applications. No. Nope. And that's why I but hate wouldn't that be, like, a better thing for, like, a mascarpone? I, I don't know, but like I I like my ricotta savory on pizza, Ooh. and that's and that's it. That's the only way I like ricotta. I don't like lasagna, so ricotta's not. Yeah, I would say something to try. Um, for anybody who wants to make make their own lasagna, uh, try cottage cheese instead of ricotta. It sounds weird, but once it's it in is. there, like all the curds will melt and everything, and it it gives it kind of a kind of a sweetness, but it's still, um, it's still, like, uh, savory and salty enough that it, it doesn't taste odd. Right. So, um, because of that, I hate Tofutis, uh, ricotta. Oh, yeah, I'm not a fan. Well, my grandma will actually do, she's, yeah, what my grandma will do, um, she's, 
she's been vegan for a very long time, is uh, Tofuti's, or it might not be Tofuti brand, but better than sour cream. That's what she'll use as the ricotta in a vegetarian lasagna. Because it's 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 not it, it's a little bit of a sour cream flavor, but for the most part, it's a lot thicker. It is closer to like a ricotta um, uh, uh, consistency. Um. So for me, I like I said, I don't like lasagna, but um. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um. Sorry, the animals are kicking. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, like, this is as good as it's gonna get. That's what I'm like. Not that it's anybody else's business, but, like, this is why I was telling you earlier not to worry about it. Um, oh, yeah. The, nah. I mean, that's, uh, in my experience with edible, it's always like that. It takes way too long, and it's always pretty underwhelming. submarine, but I can't call it what's bad. There's like a, an area that you can't go as the other two. Where is it? I, this is like my least favorite world in this game because it's, it's so difficult. It's so difficult to navigate and it's so difficult to remember where anything's at. Plus, like, I just hate underwater levels. Like the... Coco, if you're watching, I just saw the Dexter's lab. Thank you, Twin. <laughs> that is fucking killing me. Dexter's lab. Hold on, I'm gonna look at this. It's from Lol Burger. Okay, let's see. Let's see. Dexter's lab, the lost episode. Uh, da da da. Pro, 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 let's see. Let's see here. Lost episode. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> oh. oh, did you see the story where cops were like, we were poisoned at Shake Shack and then. Yeah, like, Coco and I. Uh, turns out, no, we weren't. Yeah, Coco and I were just going over that, and as as they, they found out, it's just. It was just a, 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 a washing error. Like, basically, they just did not rinse off the cups well enough and so instead of thinking like a fucking human being oh they made a mistake we should be we should let them know that hey uh these cups aren't okay can we get a replacement no immediately they're like these fuckers poisoned us let's ruin their entire company yeah and like this has happened in the past like there's one where the cup had pink written on their cup and they found out later he wrote it yeah, it was, was uh, well, I, I, I've heard both that he wrote it, and I've also heard that um, that was just a common joke that he had with that Starbucks that he went to consistently. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah. And then, then his superior saw it and freaked the fuck out. That's and right. he was too much of a fucking wuss Puss. to, like, go back and be like, actually, that's, that's not an issue. Like, fucking just stand up for yourself, dude. You're a cop. You're supposed to be... Brave, according to something. And then there was another instance where a cop, like, claims he had ordered a burger and somebody had taken a bite out of it. And yeah. then he remembered later that he had been the one that took a bite out of it. Yeah. Or I think that was a Subway, so that would have been a sandwich, but... Uh, I remember it being a burger. <laughs> but, like, the fact that it happens more than once, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the Wait. thing, is that, that they, they're on a fucking power trip. That's all being a cop is. It's a 24-7 fucking power trip, and you, pure paranoia. So it's like, great, we have somebody with too much authority and who's been trained to be paranoid, and we gave them a gun and said, kill whoever you want. You'll be, you'll be covered legally. Genius work, guys. We did it. We set up a, a good system. Good system, guys. We did a good job. Good work. Did you see the... Um... Cops, undercover as drug dealers, arrested cops that were undercover as drug buyers. 
<laughs> oh yeah, that was a little while ago, but yeah, that was a good one. God. Fuck, I'm just gonna go and not be in so I'm just gonna skip this world for as long as I can, to be honest. I'm not planning on 100%ing this game anyways, so like, I'm just gonna skip this shit. It's been like a fucking hour of me just rambling around in the, the goddamn ocean. What do you do this time? So, earlier in an interview, Arn Anderson said something to the effect of, do I think Sami Zayn... Like, he was talking about butting heads with Sami Zayn a lot. Sure. And made the comment that he didn't think Sami Zayn would ever be able to move into a producer's room. Because he's too stubborn. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Yeah. Jim Cornette jumped in to say, yeah, Sami Zayn sucks. Uh, basically say, you can't effing get this guy to start arguing about the goddamn, you know, effing what you're going to have for lunch to determine whether or not the whole group is going to start or not. He's on minute details that he won't fucking let go. He's a pain in the ass and as an agent. My God, he's an agent's worst nightmare because I've tried to age him. Uh, he's a personable but annoying effort in person, and you know he came straight off the independence where he had to do his shit, and he had to die on every hill. Hmm. Like, <laughs> fucking, yeah, I can't stand working with, did you ever consider that no one could stand working with your ass, Jim Cornette? No, oh, chick, chick. Um. Jim Cornette can just choke on it already. Yeah, I just, none of that was warranted, man. You could have just, like, just not <laughs> any of that. Like, here is where Jim Cornette, in my opinion, fucked up. He turned the microphone on. Mm -hmm. And then for however long, didn't turn it off. Yeah. Like, at this point, if you, if you are a Jim Cornette fan, at this point, you have to be comfortable being a fan of a racist, a misogynist, a fucking just shitty personality person. Yep. Like, what is there to be a fan of? Oh, he was a great man. He knows good Brooklyn. So do, like, so many other channels that aren't racist or misogynist or yeah. just awful in general. Doesn't matter how good he is at what he does, if he can't do that while also being a good person, then he's not worth anything. And he's not really good at what he does. Like, no company has ever been like, God, we're doing so well right now. We are just overachieving. We are, you know, making money hand over fist. You know what we need? Jim Cornette. Jim Cornette's who you bring in when you can't get anybody else. Yeah. Jim Cornette is who you bring in when the money is circling the drain, company's barely holding on, you need just a little bit of cash to, you know, just somebody that the people recognize. You know, that's when you bring in Jim Cornette. Jim Cornette is a last ditch effort. Jim Cornette is, you're hoping to drum up controversy. You don't bring in Jim Cornette because, ah, uh, this is the way we want this company to go. Yeah, exactly. And the fact that Billy Corgan started off NWA Power with Jim Cornette on commentary tells me that I don't want to watch NWA Power, and I'm not going to like what Billy Corgan... Because if that's where you're starting from... Like, if you're starting from that point where you're like, Jim Cornette is the face I want on here. I don't trust your opinion on things. Yeah, I already didn't trust Billy Corgan because of his fucking bullshit, but... Like, just that added to it. Yeah. Like, it's, that made it... It's all just a mess. And... That, while we're talking controversies, there's one... Uh, that I wanted to get your opinion on, which is um, a Game Grumps controversy that happened more recently, which is that 
Aaron finally tore down the Confederate statue that is the JonTron episodes. They're all deleted or at least privated. So obviously somebody's archived them, so it's not a perfect solution, but he's he's officially backing away from that. And um okay. I've seen Watch. some people say that uh, I agree with this that he's grown. And like yeah, he grew up with new grounds and all that nonsense edgelord garbage that kind of turned him into a shitty dude for quite a while. But he's grown a lot as a person and um he he actually he supports uh Black Lives Matter and the protests and he's like spoken out against racism in these times. But then there are people who are saying that he's only doing that because of the brand. It, specifically, someone I saw was like, Oh, he only did it to protect the brand, he doesn't care. He hesitated. That was their problem. It's like, he hesitated. It's like, well, he made the right decision. And also, not for nothing, but like, if, you're, if your brand is the sole thing uh, keeping you and all of your friends like, in a job and in health insurance, especially during a pandemic, it's like, I, you might hesitate in doing something that might hamper that. And yeah. I, 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 like, yeah. Especially when your bigger source of income was a touring company that just got, you know, its legs cut out from under it. Exactly, yeah. which is what the, they came back with and they're like, oh, he's got a touring company. I, I disengaged at that point. I, I've decided to fucking just... I've improved my fuck it reflex, which is the the reflex of just... Just fuck it. I don't care anymore. They can they can be like that if they want to and mute the conversation, block them. I'm, I'm just done at this point. I used to get into so many conversations on Twitter and tried to argue my point, but at a certain point I realized it's like they're not even in... Nobody's interested in changing their opinion. Even if they realize they're wrong, they'll never admit it. Yeah, and, like, there is fair criticism to be lobbed into here and, and Annie. Oh, yeah, there's some stuff... Like, stu ooh, there, there is some stuff from those earlier episodes that yeah. is, is pretty rough, but they, yeah. they've, they've changed. Like, they don't do a lot of the more messed up stuff that they used to do. Right, they have matured. A great deal, and, yeah. And, like, they've you know, admitted to, like, wrongdoing in the past, like... Yeah, we were wrong to say this. You know, we are sorry for hurting people for saying this. You know, we're going to try to do better in the future. And on a lot of it, they have. There's times when they're, like, not perfect, but you could tell that it comes from a place of ignorance more than malice or uh, mockery. Right. And for me, that's more important than, like, whether they always get something, like, they, and a lot of the times, if they're getting something kind of wrong, it's something that they don't know about, like, uh, often, yeah, they're, I... like, trying to figure out, like, uh, uh, I'm just gonna make up a scenario, like, uh, Furries. Like, when they- oh, the fur- actually, I can just pull that scenario, because, like, Aaron didn't know what it was. Right. Like, he had a vague idea. And Danny was asking what it was, so he had no idea. And this was back when the dance of furry stuff first started. He was like, so what is a furry? And neither one of them knew. And you can watch the- there's like a, a, a game best of compilation. And it's the furry, like, arc which reignited the other day. Right. Um, I mean, Dan's finally just embraced it, which yeah, is yeah. honestly the healthier choice, which because... Is, eh. And, like, think about it. Like, they went from, I think it's you want to fuck people in mascot outfits, to, I'm a furry. Like, that's growth. And that shows that, like, they understand and the like, position they have, that's... and they're working to... Yeah. Right. I will say, I will say now, and I know that even with what we're talking about, it's not a, a popular, like, thing. But yeah, I'm, I'm definitely a furry by any definition. But the general definition, that's the thing, is that it's a generally, it, it's, and not, like, in any political way, but it's sort of like Antifa, where people treat it like it's a specific group that has specific ideals, but in reality, it's just a specific ideology, effectively. Yeah, and with fascist. 
yeah, and so with furries, it's like you just like anthropomorphic animal uh, characters and like literally just enjoying something like Zootopia or like Disney's Robin Hood could qualify you to be a furry if you like it well, enough. Yeah, and that was one of the definitions they were given. But then, uh, and, like, the, the animators are some of the best on this subject. Mm -hmm. Like, the Mickey Man <laughs> fucking kills me to this day. But, um, you know, another definition for them that they were given was that you had to identify with, like, a furry character that you, you know, your own, for, you had to have a fursona, basically. Not a, necessarily. It's um. Yeah, well, that was what some of the people were saying. So like, there's that, that's no, the thing. Again, yeah, it's it's so furry. general because like that is one way to be a furry, and that's one way that people um people will embrace it. But it's really whatever you want it to be. You can it, you can embrace and interact to whatever level you're comfortable with, or whatever level appeals to you. Honestly, it's gen it's just a general category in the same way that someone might be a fan of something. But it's it's just gotten this bad stigma because, yeah, there is the 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 more sexual quote unquote deviancy side of it that a lot of people freak out about. Like I, my dad is. I, I don't see the deviancy side as like being necessary because. Uh, no, like, it's not. That's the thing. Is that's that's an aspect of it. Like, and there's no I, I there's no like, avoiding it really or ignoring it if you get deep enough into the community. But right, but it, like yeah. for me. I don't think just being a fan of anthropomorphic characters in general is quite enough because, as Dan points out, then everyone's just a big old furry. That's my point. And, and um, I would say you, it has to be a little more involved, but it does not have to be like like you have to be a fan, like not just oh yeah, I enjoy Bugs Bunny. Like, mm. it, because I I, like, I would disagree personally, but I feel like. The main reason people feel that way is because they are, they 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 have recognized the stigma that surrounds the term furry, and they don't want to, they don't want that to be applied to themselves, even just when they are casual, because the uh, the vast majority of people are gonna assume you are one of the more extreme members of the furry community if you say I am a furry. Right, but like by that definition. Like, again, everyone is, because, like, everyone likes, you know, Bugs Bunny or Mickey Mouse or something, right? Well, that's my point. And it's like, like, it's it's kind of an, it's kind of a needless term, because it can kind of apply to everybody. But, like, if I were to say, oh, yeah, <laughs> I like sports, that does not automatically make me say a basketball fan. So, but, by your definition, well, if you like sports, you like basketball. Basketball is a sport. Well, no, 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 because that's that's again so, the thing is I'm... The, the adding basketball fan would mean you know, would be like adding the furry layer, like you are another step removed from just a casual observer, which I would say most people are to such things, hmm. versus a okay. furry who is actively enjoying it for that fact that it is an anthropomorphic character. Like, if I watched, you know, Bugs Bunny and it was, you know, humans, all humans, but the jokes were all the same, that's just the Three Stooges. I love the Three Stooges. Hmm. You know, it's not the fact that he is a rabbit that makes it funnier. It's, you know, and so, that's, for me, the difference. Like, if it's it's the liking the fact that it is an animal character, whereas the average person is just enjoying the cartoon. Like, sure. yeah, I like Bugs Bunny, but not because he is a bunny. And that, I think, is the defining I'll, I'll say, okay, yes. Uh, I, I will agree. I think that's the distinction that needs to be made, is enjoying an anthropomorphic animal specifically because they are that. If, if it if the fact that they are an anthropomorphic animal can be removed from your enjoyment of it, then I suppose that would not really qualify. But if you enjoy an anthropomorphic animal character specifically because they are an anthropomorphic animal, that would qualify. Right. Okay, yeah, that, that, that would be the distinction, so... Yeah, so that's a, a level removed from the casual viewer. 
it's, um, yeah. And I, I feel like, from everything I've seen online, because I am very not a furry, like, at all. Um, but from everything I've seen online, I feel like there's a, a very hard line between, uh, furries and Sonic fans. Yeah, they're a very different breed. Like, technically they count as furry, but I feel like they are a part of a Venn diagram that does not intersect with the rest of the Venn diagram. I mean, sometimes it does, but yeah, the, the, the hardcore Sonic fans are the, are a very particular dissolution of the whole thing. Yeah, and they... Like, most of what I know comes from either shit posters on Twitter or uh, like college humor or dorkly videos making mm -hmm. fun of it. Sure. But there's also very specific fetishes that seem to come with the Sonic fandom that while may exist outside, mostly exist in the Sonic fandom. Sure. Well, yeah, I think... I know there are some that, you know, at, at the height of uh, Tumblr, they were more universal than other, you know, fandoms, but after Tumblr died, it seems like it just stayed with the Sonic fans only. Certainly, yeah. I think... I, I, I think the, the best content... Ah, shit. Um, the, the best content about Sonic fans making fun of them it comes from someone like an Aaron Hansen who is admittedly a huge fan of the series so truly understands what it, the 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 core of the whole situation similar to how like um uh similar to how some of the best furry comedy comes from furries themselves because they they recognize how to make the comedy accurate in a way that oh, yeah. makes it so much better. Uh, Jeff Foxworthy would agree that that's what makes his redneck jokes so much more potent is he is one. Exactly. And that, I, I, he has a rule about who you're allowed to make fun of, and I, for you know, the most part, fully agree with this rule, um, unless you're punching up. That's the only time when this rule is allowed to be broken. Mm -hmm. uh, and the rule is you're not allowed to make fun of one unless you are one. So he was, you know, he said you're not allowed to make fun of rednecks unless you are one. You're not allowed to make fun of whoever unless you are one. Yeah. But when it comes to rednecks, I are one, so... <laughs> It's like, you you can, technically, freedom of speech, you can make fun of whoever, but it's like, it's, at, at best, it's going to be less funny than it would be if someone who actually was part of that group did it. And at worst, it's going to be some, some ignorant shit that's going to just offend people. Yeah, and a lot of, like, uh, I know Chris Rock for a while had people who wrote jokes with him. Hmm. for him to perform. Sure. And th that's a fairly common thing for, like, people who get to that point and still mostly do stand-up. Sure. Like, instead of foraying into movies, it is apparently common for a lot of those high-tier comedians to have writers that, you know, help them write because, you know, yeah. they're so busy touring, they're not really living and getting all this stuff that they're writing about. You know, life experiences. Exactly. And uh, I'm trying to remember the comedian that told the like format. He's like, first you have jokes about you know your town, mm -hmm. and then you do those jokes at your local open mic. Sure. Then eventually you start going to other towns and you tell the jokes about your hometown, and then you come back. You're like, I have no new jokes about my town, but let me tell you a joke about the town I was just in. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes, you know, Bruno, you start off telling jokes about your life, then your town, then the neighbor town, and then it's just you going around town to town, and all your jokes are about traveling now, yeah. and making fun of different towns you've been in, and telling weird stories about towns you were just in. And then you start telling the life stories again. And... Yeah, you start pulling uh, out all the, the deep cuts. Yeah, but like, 
it's not uncommon for that life story space to be written with a team. I think, I feel like that's what happened with Eminem, because everybody pretty much agrees that he sucked once he started getting fame, and that's honestly why, is because his best stuff was when he was struggling, and when he had some real shit to say, but then, like, yeah. when he, um, when he got famous and he wasn't struggling anymore, it's like, he still could, he still had good flow, and he still had kind of fun wordplay, but, like, his, his songs just didn't have the soul that they used to, they didn't have have that that air of uh just genuine like struggle the way that they did when he was real poor yeah i don't agree with that necessarily because it reinforces that uh old mindset of you have to be a struggling artist to be good oh no i'm not saying that but i'm saying specifically with the, the trajectory of his career like that's clearly what happened is that he well, he wasn't able to find he wasn't, he wasn't able to find inspiration in his new environment the way he did um in, in his old so one. much or is it that people related more to his struggling uh, lyrics and by not struggling anymore they didn't relate to him but he's still talking about what is his life yeah sure that I, to yeah me, it comes up for as you know and it's not necessarily even a thing of you have to be a struggling artist to relate to people. It, like, that you shouldn't have to struggle to make art, period. And Yeah. But if what people love about you is that they could relate to you and suddenly they can't, then the trick isn't to, you know, fake that. It's not on you to, you know, start lying about what your life is. You are allowed to talk about the life you actually live, you know? And there's struggles with it, and people don't believe that until, you know... For instance, if you grew up poor, like I did, and you're suddenly in a position where that's not as much of a thing anymore, you're, you know, comfortable, it's weird. You're not prepared for it. You still have poor mentality, because... Yeah. And it, it, it is a thing, like, having money, you fucking spend it all the minute you get it, because you're afraid it won't be there, you know? Yeah. And you wind up holding yourself back and making things worse, and then you get a little bit of money, you're like, I'm gonna save it this time, and then you spend it the minute you get it. And it's, yeah, that's what happens, and people are like, Oh, you've got money now. It must be so hard. Like, yes, because I've never been taught what to do with it, you know? Yeah. Um, and I'm not, like, saying I'm rich or anything. I'm fucking not. But, like, I'm at a point where, like, if I want to buy a video game once a month, I can. And before now, that was not an option. You know, I could not afford a video game twice a year, you know, I'm, the, some, the idea of something like, uh, Gamefly is incredible to me, like, that I could afford Gamefly now, uh, and that's $15 a month, you know, yeah. uh, the concept that, you know, I would be comfortable enough financially that I could afford something like that, or that I could, uh, get PlayStation Plus even, you know, that concept is fucking foreign to me, you know, years ago. Or the idea that I'd be able to go to a convention, or that I would, you know, be able to fly out to Seattle, or, you know, any of the stuff that I've done over the past few years. You know, like I said, I worked at fucking Walmart and at a fucking family dollar and shit. Like, I wasn't making money. I was barely surviving, you know? Yeah. And so to now be in a position where I'm surviving and things are fine, it's weird and I'm constantly anxious waiting for the rug to be pulled out from under me. Because growing up poor, you are always aware of the rug sliding underneath your feet at all times. Sometimes it's quick, sometimes it's slow. But you're always aware of the rug. And now there's no rug. 
I have hardwood floors, apparently. But like, I'm constantly afraid of the rug. Uh, yeah, man. All I gotta say, you know, eat the rich. But um, <clears throat> yeah. It's uh, I I guess with Eminem for me, it's just like he. It, it feels like he lost some of his genuineness and it, specifically like when people started disliking him is when he stopped doing a lot of songs that were like had any like real issues behind them and he basically just started fucking just joking around which I would say were you listening to the guy because like most of his shit was just joking around from the start he's always been yeah, um, but a lot of people hate them because they're there for, for like toy soldiers, or um like Mockingbird, but it's like that's not really what his thing was about. Like he would come out with those when he was inspired to, but most of his stuff was just goofy shit. Yeah, I liked the goofy shit. More yeah, same. Than, like going back, I'm just like. Uh, it is very of its time. Yeah. Um, I, it's not something I would listen to today for, like, a road trip. But, you know, it's not something that if it came on the radio, I'd be like, ugh. And funny thing, my son loves Eminem. Yeah. Like, and I'm just like, really, man? And he's like, yeah, he's like 13, right? Almost. He'll be 13. August. That's that's about the the peak Eminem age. It's just yeah. it's just immature enough that like. Yeah, I played him some old Eminem from like when I was a teenager. Like uh, uh, now the FCC won't let me be, let me be me. So look, see, uh, yeah, without me. Yeah. Uh, I played him that. And he just stared at me like, what is this? I'm like, it's Eminem. And he looked at my phone, and he just looked back and he said, What? Is this a joke? I'm like, no, this was one of his biggest hits. And he's like, are you, are you serious? I'm like, yeah. This is what he got famous for when I was your age. And he was like, are you serious? And he thought I was fucking with him, because apparently he only knew the serious him and him. Yeah, they're very different, very different dudes. Yeah. Which is why he he's he like did most of the serious ones he would do as Marshall Mathers and not Eminem. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why and the really ridiculous ones he did is Slim Shady, you know, like Yep, yep. But Yeah. I it was okay. Like for what it was. It was better than Tom Green's Bum Bum song. Which oh, sure. got but for some reason, everybody like compared the two. I remember them being compared to each other a lot. I'm like, no, no, this one at least has a message. Yeah. The other, the other is not even good at being a satire or parody. I. Tom Green is is a strange like phenomenon. I. I've never, I've never liked his work. I and oscillate I'm, between. Is he, is he like a fucking Andy Kaufman genius that's completely unappreciated in his time? Or is he just a fucking idiot? I, I honestly can't tell sometimes. I believe, oh, who was it before I say it out loud, I'm gonna Google it. It's one of two people that I really enjoy that do, uh... Uh, Lindsay Ellis. Yes. Lindsay Ellis. Okay. Yep. Yeah, that's one of her yeah. only uh, nostalgic woman videos that she still has on her channel. That and the um the Lord of the Rings ones. Yeah. Um. So <sighs> she talked about whether it's like a Donis masterpiece or not. I watched it. Freddy got fingered one time. Okay. Right. One time, I was at a Halloween party in high school. I had just impressed, apparently, a group of girls. I found this out later, that they were actually impressed. I just did it because I was very bored and wanted to look edgy. Um, right. It's really easy, if you know what you're doing, to walk through a campfire. Or a bonfire. Huh. 
if you know what you're doing and if you're careful. I just happen to be up, or happen to do them. Uh, so, I mean, similar to walking on hot coals, right? No, because you got shoes on here. Well, yeah, I mean, like, in the same way that, like, if you if you keep a steady stride, don't pause or anything, you'll be able to get through before the heat is, like, strong enough to hurt you. Much in the same way you can, like, grab a hot pan for, like, a second before it actually hurts. Right. Um, or dip your hand in molten lead. Oh, wow. Uh, if you dip your hand in water, get it here nice and wet, mm, yep. and then you can quickly dunk it in molten lead, because of the latent frost effect. Now, that said, there's a scientist I watched recently who discussed the latent frost effect and said he didn't believe that that was what was protecting your hand. Hmm. So he then dried his hand off completely and did it again, and he was fine. Oh. He said, and he said, it was significantly hotter than if I had dipped it in water first. Right. But as you can see, I am unharmed. And, uh, therefore, I don't think it was the lake frost effect that kept me safe. So how does the, uh, lake and frost? Lake and frost. Lake and frost. How does it work? Imagine an extremely hot pan, sure. right? Like a cast iron skillet. You then drop a bead of water on to see if it's hot, and it bounces around, slides around, and... Sure, yeah, it'll, it'll beat up. Right. That is the lake frost effect. Okay. What what is happening is the pan or whatever is so hot that it is flash evaporating the water the second it touches, mm -hmm. so that the water, the bead of water, actually has a cushion of vapor holding it up. Oh, so similar to um, in a sauna. A saunas generally can actually go much hotter than your body should be able to tolerate, but because uh, your sweat is evaporating around you in a, a layer of uh, effectively cooler, like, vapor, like, it does protect you enough, so that... It, which is why you do not want to move around very much in a sauna, because then your protective cloud of sweat is not going to do much for you. Right. So, I, I would assume it's similar, no. but... I'm high, so, uh, but basically, and you can actually make a special looking staircase out of uh, aluminum or something, and put a drop of water on it, once it's hot enough, and it will climb the stairs. Oh. So, what they believe the latent frost effect is doing with the liquid lead is it's evaporating so quickly that it's creating a gas bubble around your hand that is protecting you from the lead. And if you time it right and you get the oil to boiling hot temperature but not boiling oil, the distinction being that you're getting it up to 100 to C, which is the boiling point of water, but without a, a nucleation point that can actually cause it to uh, boil. Right. Yeah. And so you get the oil that hot, it will not boil, no, ma no matter what you do, the nucleation point be damned, because at 100 C it is not a boiling liquid. But it is hot enough to boil water. You want it that hot for the latent frost effect to take place. Because if it's too cold, the water won't flash oil. <laughs> so, you can do it with oil if you know what you're doing and you do it right. And it's really impressive looking. A uh, physics girl on YouTube has a video on this. Uh, she's very interesting. And I like her videos. Sure. If you if you like uh, science adjacent or engineering style videos, Simone Yerch is the best. Hmm. I love her videos. She makes shitty robots. Nice. Um, like you may have seen one of her inventions before. She's gone viral a couple of times. Uh, one was for an alarm clock she made that she said. Uh, you know, her parents would physically wake her up in the mornings 
so having a loud noise doesn't work. Right. So she made an alarm clock with a servo on the top and a metal, or no, a, a rubber hand attached to the servo so that it Ooh. spun and slapped her in the face when it went off in the morning. Good. And, uh, she, you know, made one that would pour cereal and feed it to her. <laughs> like, oh, she, yeah, I've seen a, a, a gif of one of the, um, tests of that that was it was not finished she made a soup bot which is my favorite one i have to send you a cook on that one. Oh sure and when her name is yerch but it's spelled g-i-e-r-t-z oh okay uh and she's from the norse peninsula what's that one called uh oh um i want to say she's swedish i could be wrong that sounds right. Uh, God, she's either Swedish or she's from that like peninsula where it's like Norway, Sweden. Um, oh God, I can't think of. Uh, she cut her Tesla into a pickup truck before before uh, they announced the abomination truck. I can't even, cannot um, even begin with that. That was something that was really disappointing to me. Um, Artemis Fowl, the movie is out on Disney Plus, and I'm a huge fan of the book series. I saw a gif. I will not be watching that movie. <laughs> it was, it was, it was so disappointing. Like the thing is, the good parts were the parts that were taken directly from the book. Everything else was pretty awful. I do like a few choices. <laughs> Um, Josh Gad as Mulch Diggum's perfect. Judy Dench as uh, Commander Root, unexpected but a great choice. Um, but like the very technology in that, it looks like the Cyber Truck, and it oh, it's so ugly. I saw a gif of Diggum's unhinging his jaw. Oh, that's the, that's the, that's from the book, and that that is. Oh, I know it's from the book. I didn't need to see him shitting the dirt out. Oh, it's not nearly as graphic as they describe it in the book. I'll be honest. No, no, no. The gif I saw was graphic enough. All right. Like the gif I saw was. Uh, well, that's the thing. Hand... That was my favorite part of the books. Was um, was like how they handled. Uh, dwarf like anatomy because they'd always be revealing new weird shit that dwarves could do, like the fact that their their beard hairs are Can like yeah they like they if you pluck them within seconds they become rigid so you can put them into a they can like prehensile them into a lock and then pluck them and it's the perfect size of the lock, but then also Which, they're the problem um. With that theory. That's not how lock well, picking works. Uh, at yeah, all. I, I, I know. It's, it's not always like that, but like that's the general idea. Um, but I mean that worked with a circular lock. Um, um, if it's like the kind where it's just a tab inside the knob that you have to flick, like a, like you can do it with a, a screwdriver or a tuna can opener, mm. like. No, I'm talking. I'm talking the the like circular lock that you could use like a pen, um, to unlock. Uh, so there are a few locks that you can pick with like, like here's the thing. If the beard hair can do that, it's better to just like make an actual lock pick. Yeah, like it, it would be basically con be constantly having a shim that you could instantly form into whatever shape. Right, but like, lockpicks are super straightforward. Like, I, I mean, you've seen me pick locks. You've picked locks with yep. me before. No, I know. Like, lockpicking is so much more interesting, and the mechanisms behind a path, or uh, like tumbler lock, are so much more interesting. Um, and picking, like, just lockpicking in general is way easier than you would think. It's scary. It's really scary. Again, that's one of those things that I just happen to know. 
Yeah, it's really scary, some of the stuff I know how to do. Um, one of the stranger things is, like, I was talking to a friend who was a magician, and she was showing us, me and Maddie, her chains and explaining that they were gimmicks. So she never really needed the key. She lost the key years ago for the padlock that was on the chains because the chains were gimmicked to come apart at the back. So you never had to unlock the chain for any reason. Right. And so as she was explaining that she had lost the key, she didn't need it. Before she could finish that sentence, I had picked it and handed it back to her. And she just, she was like, yeah, so, uh, it unlocks in the back, so I really don't have to, oh. <laughs> and she just, like, looked at this lock that had been locked for years, that I just, like, undid in the span of a sentence. And she was like, I will never buy these locks to store anything important ever again. Yup. Because, like, once you know how easy it is to pick a lock, you start appreciating locks that are uh, more difficult to pick. Like, our apartment lock in Savannah was really difficult to pick because you couldn't get a tension bar into it. Like, right. You, you couldn't put it under tension at all because uh, the you could, if you put a tension bar in or even a wrong key, it would turn. Hmm. It would just turn automatically. It would not unlock, though. So, you had to have the right key in, or it would not unlock. Right. And, so, you, there was nowhere you could really turn it to get tension on it for it to, for you to pick it. Hmm. And, yeah. And, it was really neat. I don't know how they did that, but I liked it a lot. Um... I, you know, had limited success with picking house locks, but right. I can pick most handcuffs. I can pick. I, I don't even try and pull the crap of. What if I said that, that extra pin in the back? You can't pick those. Yes, I can. Yeah. Um, those I can easily get out of standard handcuffs with one tool. Like it's stupidly easy. And, especially because I can hide, I have handcuff keys hidden on me at like 90% of the time. Um, bump keys, I have some of those. I have two lock picking sets. I have uh, made shims. I carry a handcuff shim on my keychain. Um, it's super easy. Like, the one thing that would be the hardest for me to get out of if I were tied up tomorrow, duct tape, easy. Uh, yeah. handcuffs or locks, easy. From would be my hardest thing, especially if my hands were tied behind my back. Because I'm, right. like, I'm not flexible enough to get my hands in front of me. And I would have to... The only tool I know of for breaking out of rope is a uh, paracord. <laughs> and you can also use that for duct tape, but there's an easier method if you're oh, strong yeah. enough for duct tape. But you do have to be pretty fucking strong and just willing to take a bruise to the chest. Um, but for rope, if you're tied up, you want paracord shoelaces. And the reason you want paracord shoelaces is so that you can untie your shoes, uh, unlace the shoe. And this is if you've got, like, the ability or the time to do this. Uh, you would unlace your shoes, tie the end of the paracord to one shoe and the other end to the other shoe, with the paracord going over your ropes, and you would saw back and forth with your feet through the rope with the paracord. Um, and it'll work. It, it works. Even on paracord itself, it will cut through because that paracord is stationary 
while the other paracord is moving across and it's taking more friction over a smaller surface area. So it'll cut through uh, paracord bindings as well. Same thing for duct tape. Um, it will do the same thing. And if your feet are duct taped as well, your hands should be dexterous enough to get something going there. If uh, not, then what you want to do is try the other method. And here's the thing, you should try the other method first if your feet are duct taped. Do not try to untie the tape with your duct taped hands, because that's not going to be a good idea. What you should do first is put your elbows together, lift your arms as high above your head as you can, and then bring your arms down to your chest, and as your elbows get to your torso, spread them out, and try to basically use your chest as a wedge to break the tape. It will hurt. It will suck. It's the best method for getting the tape off. Right, because the, thi the thing with duct tape is it's pretty high tensile strength until it gets one tiny tear, and then it'll just shred. Right, and the reason you don't want to try and do the other thing first is you've only got one or two shots at that before you're stuck. Because if it starts to roll and bind up, it won't uh, break anymore. Yeah, it's just reinforced. It's yeah, so if you try untying your feet first, you're gonna bind and roll that up and have a hard time breaking it. Um, what you should do is try to break it first, and failing that, I prefer the method of hiding a blade around your ankle and cutting the tape with that and then gently cutting it away from your wrists. Um, I am also, you know, I don't wear shoes, I wear flip flops because I have messed up feet, so the paracord thing doesn't work for me. So I carry a paracord bracelet uh, whenever I'm like, you know, out and about in a way without um, concern for my safety or the safety of others. You know, like maybe if you go to a protest, uh, mm -hmm. paracord shoelaces. For that reason, it's durable. It can be used as a tourniquet. It can be used to, you know, as a rope. It's uh, self-cutting when you do the sawing thing. It's very useful in a variety of ways. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm for, for modern rope, for fuck's sake, of course I know, like, stuff like this, and, you know, this is what kind of stuff I wrote about, like, how to make a hammock out of duct tape, how to make, you know, anything out of HGPE, how to, it's just what I did for a living, you know? So, I'm not saying that I was prepping for something like this, but now is the time, if you're a protester, to look at stuff like, uh, the modern rogue and whatnot. Yeah, exactly. I mean, in general, it's just a decent enough life skill. You never know what situation you'll be in, and once you're in it, it's too late to look it up. Yeah. And here's a fun thing. You can pick locks with a vibrator. Yes. It's so weird to watch. I've specific... Um, I need to figure out how to do that. I've had this, like... I've had... A... Uh, a just, like, a standard, like, padlock, combination lock on my backpack for a long time. And I've tried doing the vibrator method, but I never seem to figure out where the flywheels need to line up. Because it's not... It's definitely not the top. And I've tried turning it, but it's it must be specific enough because it's not at any of the like 15 degree marks. You want me to try and pick it when we come down? I mean, if you could, yeah, because I honestly like it's just thick enough that like I bolt cutters would be a pain in the ass. And it's it's just heavy enough that it's always like fucking with me whenever I'm using it. I could also bring my angle grinder. <laughs> I mean, that would also be good. We can try picking first, and then, uh, angle grinding, if 
that today also. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like a way to go. But, um, yeah, so... You know what? Uh, the game I'm playing right now actually faithfully... Pretty faithfully re recreates what picking a lot feels like. Hmm. And actually recreates the method pretty well. Is uh, Judgment. Judgment? It's uh, Yakuza spinoff. Oh. Ah. I got the words Yakuza and Jacuzzi mixed up the other day. <laughs> And now I'm in hot water with the Japanese Mafia. God damn it. Oh. I stole that one from Game Grumps. Oh. I mean, honestly... Most, a uh, good portion of my jokes. I, I was about to say most, but not quite most. Um, most of them come from Comic Bang Bang, to be honest. But, uh, yeah, Game Grumps. Specifically, like, all the deep cuts that they don't reference that often. Oh, I finished. By the way, I finished House Party. The original run or the... Both, both. I, well, I, I hadn't watched the original run yet, so I watched through just the full playlist that includes the, the grump side of it, and... Wow! Uh, first off, going from the original run, and then the next episode, it's just so improved. Both in visual quality, but also story quality. Yeah. Like, it was a lot less toxic. It was. I mean, they point out that it's like... Kind of the idea is that these are all shitty people and you're not supposed right. to like any of them. Right, but they do kind of like flesh out the characters more 3D and make them a lot less awful. Yeah. And they give them they give them more to to go with and um they what didn't did change any of the voice lines as far as I could tell. Like I know the grumps were felt like Frank had been changed, but I'm pretty sure it was exactly was. the same one. Was he? Yeah, well, it sounded I mean, the same to me. The voice actor may not have changed, but uh, they, he did get a lot more lines. Than yeah, they, they definitely added some stuff, but like, the basic well, so stuff... you're asking whether the voice actor changed. I don't know. Well, no. I'm, I'm, it's definitely the same voice. It's all the same voice cast. Also, and it's pretty much what, I'm, what like they... Recorded. Right, because they, they were like specific to the house of the go and dude, like they they were like, that doesn't sound right, but like listening to them back to back, I'm pretty sure like they basically just added more lines to the original recordings. Well, it's probably because like I think Danny said at one point, they parodied it so much themselves that they exaggerated it beyond what it originally was. I think and, yeah, that's definitely what happened. And it became their full memory of what it originally was. And yeah, after the first couple times, they talked over it pretty much every time, so... They probably just did not hear it again until the, the new one, and then just coming in fresh. It was also two years later, so they probably just forgot. Yeah. And but that whole Grumps, like, storyline, all the, the bits... What do you think of Frank joining the club? Oh, that, that whole line was great. I like, one of the comments was like... Danny, oh, they said I could maybe flirt with Rachel, but I wanted to be respectful to my girlfriend, so I didn't do it. Aaron, hey Susie, I'm making out with Frank! <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I think Susie's kind of used to that kind oh, of sure. behavior Back, from him on the show now. Like, early like, on, they, there was this thing, I, I don't know if you remember Polygrumps? It was basically, it was just in the fan art community, and it was basically... Oh, I don't do fan art. No, yeah. Do fan it was, it was, um, basically just, like, they, they, people would draw fan art of, like, all of the grumps, including, like, Aaron, Danny, Barry, Susie, sometimes John, even, Ross, like, all of them just being in, like, a polysexual relationship. And sometimes it was sweet, sometimes it was just, like, lewd, but, um... Yeah, yeah. That Susie was super into it. She was all, like, supportive of it for a while. And then, like, some people kind of crossed the line. Yeah, yeah, and she was like, okay, I gotta back away. Kind of like when she found out that there was, like, fetish work of her sneezing. 
Like, yeah. where they took, like, clips of her sneezing during her streams, for her show, and, like, edited, to, edited them together, and she was, like, very uncomfortable with that. Yeah, I don't know about that. And I'm like, uh, it was something she talked about on Twitter for a while, like, a couple years ago. And I remember thinking, that is so creepy that somebody would do that, like, and then, you know, you can see somebody like Aaron and Ross and Danny who find it wonderful that they are being rated on WikiFeed. Yeah. Because, but that's the difference is they're consenting to that. Yeah. And they they are aware of what that is. Yeah. Up front. It makes me so think of um, Mara Wilson wrote. She wrote an article for Cracked about like what it was like being a child star. Um, and she. Uh, she talked about how there was a basically a wiki feed that had her, but like specifically her as a kid in her movies and stuff. And for a while she was like, oh, isn't this, isn't this like funny? Like, haha, that's so silly. But then someone fi eventually pointed out to her, it's like, that's, that, that's effectively child porn. Like, just because you're not nude, they are masturbating to your child feet. And like, she was like, oh, that immediately kills any fun from it. Yeah, and like, Danny and Aaron, like, are okay with people doing that because they see no harm in it and they think it's really funny. And Ross is, you know, the same. And, but Susie did not put that content out to be, you know, evocative or erotic. Yeah. She did not consent to that being used in that kind of way. And that is, you know, fucking gross and uncomfortable. Really and gross. You could argue, well, maybe she would have liked it the way that Dan and Aaron, like, you know, the wiki feed thing. I'm like, no, like, you don't mm -hmm. get to do Like, it wasn't right for them to do that to Dan and Aaron to begin with. Just because they approve uh, and, you know, all that now, they didn't before, and that's just gonna be Yeah, it's, it's the same. Matters. It's the same shitty fucking, well, you like the argument. It's like, it doesn't matter whether or not. They they cared. The fact that you like took advantage of them in that way is it's still yeah. kind of messed up. Yeah, it consent fucking matters. It really does. And you know the fact that just because Dan and Aaron you know are okay with it now, you still didn't have their consent to begin with. There shouldn't be a they're okay with it now. They should have yeah. like. That said, I am like five minutes away from selling pictures of my feet for money. I mean, if someone will buy, I'm I'm super down. We are. Iggy and I will sell feet pictures. We'll be seeing each other Thursday. We will do foot on foot action. My feet. I I will tell you now. My feet are pretty ugly though. My I, feet I got some are gnarled fucking club foot. I have very hobbit eight. toe. I have eight toes on my left foot and eight toes on my right toe. Hmm. I have one really big toe from which eight toes grow. Okay. Instead of, like, the normal number of toes. And one of the toes is constantly doing sign language, but it's doing it on its own so it doesn't get the whole letter. <laughs> So you're just like reading half a message. Mm. So if you're into that, shoot us, shoot us a message. Like, I mean, we, we we expect full prices. We're not going cheap. Honestly, I'm the, talking a dollar per toe. Ooh, no, no, that's still pretty cheap. My my rule is always like, if you're if someone's gonna jack off to it, you're paying porn prices. All right, I'm not. I'm not selling that kind of stuff for cheap. What, a dollar per toe? That's nine toes on one foot and eight on the other. That's a lot of toes. Uh, I mean, if that's what you want to do, I'm, I feel like I, I can't do this partnership if you, if this is how you're going to be pricing us out. I think we should go lower. I, no. You think we're overcharging? No, no. We should be doing it for exposure. Exposure yeah. of our feet. When we cared about the art. I lost that artistic vision one day. 
Never found it again. Yeah, I got into doing feet pics on the internet for the art. Now I'm just a sellout with an OnlyFans. True. And a Patreon where you get exclusive toe content. Nice. Although Patreon doesn't allow porn anymore. You have to be sneaky about it. Feet aren't porn. I. What was, there was like a specific, what was it? There was a specific um, quote that was basically like, I can't name every fetish, but I know it when I see it. Yeah. Uh, there was a Supreme Court argument that I can't define porn, but I know it when I see it. Yes, that's what I was thinking. Um, Cause yeah, sometimes it's like, so sometimes you see something and you're like, there's no nudity, there's no sex happening, there's only one person here, but somebody's jacking off to this. And that is expressly why it was created. And hey, I'm not necessarily judging. I just want to make sure that everybody knows that that's what's happening. Yeah. So that they're not getting taken advantage of. It's like one of the few things I just like, with most fetishes or kinks, I can look at something and be like, I get it. Like, it's not for me, but I get it. Feet? Feet is just one of those where I'm like, I don't understand the appeal of the foot. You know, like, I don't see, when you look at a foot, like, you get a tingle in your dingle? Like, I don't get it. I don't... Well, keep in mind, that's how some people feel about ass. I, you know, I get that, but, I mean, far be it for me to, like, you know, can't shame anybody. I got some weird ones. And, like, ones that if you told me when I was a teenager you'll be into this, I'd have been like, I don't see it. I don't see why you would find that particular thing attractive. And, like, 33 year old me is like, I have a very specific tag I will search. And it's very difficult to find quality. Like, that's always the worst yeah. when you find out you have a fetish and then you realize nobody's making good content of it. Or even if they're making good content, it's not the one that hits it for you. They're just they're just missing the spot and you can't you can't really say much about it because you know what? They're doing their best. They're making good stuff, but you it's just not working for you. Like the worst is if you go on uh, Pornhub, there's like one channel. And, and you don't like, really care for either the people involved or the yeah, person and, involved if it's a, a singular activity. No, this is a trio activity, but Ooh. like there's one channel that really dominates on Pornhub. And it's just like. And there's not much in the way of alternate you know, content for that particular thing, and you're just like. Yeah. I just a lot of see. times because just general like investment. It's not something that someone's just gonna whip out their phone and do. They gotta buy equipment. They gotta counterweight into roof beams. Not so much for mine. Um, okay. It's just the, the opposite version of mine is very popular and you can find lots of content on it. Some, most of, a lot of which borders on racism. But, oh no. Um, <laughs> you probably just figured out which one I'm talking about, huh? I... I'd have to think about it for a minute. I gave you two clues. Three people. Uh. Mm, mm. I don't want to start throwing out guesses because considering I'll that it borders on racism. Okay. I've made two major wrestling storylines on WWE last year. We're centered on that form of it. It didn't include the racism, but a lot of the stuff you find online will. Hmm. <laughs> Rhymes with duck molding. Oh. Hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. You'll find a lot of racist stuff in that. You know, like John Arbuckle. <laughs> I just. I just, the way Danny just like, 
just throws that out so nonchalantly. Because <laughs> he's a fucking cut. Well, no, no, no. It was, uh, they were playing a Garfield game. It's like, so why does John keep making the lasagna for Garfield if he knows, you know? And, and he just goes, because he's a cuck. And he's like, losing his fucking mind. There it's was like, a good. Please, God. No, it was de it was definitely Danny who said it that time. I remember well, there was. Maybe a... it was Aaron asking about. Yeah, he was him. like, he was like, why is he always doing him lasagna? Why is he always doing this? It's like, cause John's a fucking <laughs> cuck. <laughs> also, a, a great moment was when Aaron introduced Danny to the the cuck meme, yeah. where he was like, in, he was like jokingly insulting Danny in that over the top yeah. way that's clearly sarcastic. And yeah, he was just like, was he like, like he like, he like hesitated, and he's just like, you know what, I almost just called you a cuck. And Danny's like, a, a cuckold? Like a man who, <laughs> jer who jerks off while his, his, uh, hus or his wife goes and fucks other dudes? He's like, well, you're not on the internet, Danny, but, uh... Yeah, he's so, he's so innocent, in a way. My favorite is, and I can't find this clip anywhere, but it's him talking about the up dog bit mm. and how much he hated falling for that. Right. And, and, like, there's a clip of him talking about it, and it's not the one from Katamari. It's a mm. different instance of them talking about it. Sure. And he says, what gets me is how I replied in the whitest way possible. Yeah. What is up dog? And, like, that part kills me more than the original it's, up dog. It's not bit. just that. It's the level of just, like, innocent gullibility to it. It's so perfect of where he's just like, like, at that point, Aaron has tried, like, four times, and finally Danny's just like, I don't... I, what are you... What is up dog? Yeah, it's just like... He's so, he says it so slow, and the second it, he stops talking, you can tell he figured it out, and it's, oh, yeah. beautiful, beautiful, yes. beautiful execution. I, here's the thing, I got my son with that, Ooh. and I, you Get him before they, they've been seeped in the culture that lets you, lets them know about it. What got me is he was like 11. This was less than a year ago. I got him with Updog. And uh, I was working on his phone. Like, he had done something with his phone and needed it fixed. Mm -hmm. So I was fixing his phone. And I immediately just opened his messenger app, found his mom, said, Mom, Dad got me. He got me with Updog. And she fucking replied with, What's up, dog? And I was like, oh my god, yes! Two, two just, in, two at once. And I'm like, I looked over at him and said, at least you're not 30 fucking 8 years old. Yeah, he has an excuse. Like, he, he just said, Dad, why'd you have to get mom to? I was like, I wasn't trying to. She felt like, she, I'm not trying to cast aspersions on her intelligence. But she would fall for any joke you told her. Like, you could tell her what is clearly a joke and say it happened to you. And she'd be like, uh uh, really? No, not really. Of course I'm joking. Like, of course I am joking. Like,. Yeah. If you're going to tell a, a joke joke, tell it like it happened to you. So instead of saying a man walked into a bar one day, say, the other day I was at the bar and this guy came in with a fucking duck under his arm. And that's how you tell the joke. That makes Yeah, because it, 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 it lulls people into a false sense of security where they're not even expecting a punchline. So when it hits, it hits so much harder. Yeah. And, you know, that's how... My son's mom, every time, would be like, Really? Uh-uh. That really happened. I'd be like, Yes, a talking duck came into the bar the other day. The bar that you know I don't go to because I work all day and then come home directly after work. Uh, oh, man. She, she's that kind of... 
so it wasn't as big a, a win with the updog. Yeah. But to get him first and then her. Mm. Truly a cosmic event that may may never be accomplished again. And the thing is, she thinks he did because I was texting from his phone. Nice. And pretending to be him. So I was like, see, I just got you, you know, that clap. You just got your prom. He's like, true. And I said, hey, at least you're not 38 years old and falling for it. He said, true. And I said, hey, at least you weren't looking at it in text form. I know. That's and the best right part. That, and it said, Literally, it, it could like, have just looked like a typo, but didn't, didn't think it out. Like, but that's just it. That, it was within a year, so it auto-corrected the space in. And she still... What? It said it didn't get... I was like, read it out loud. Say it out loud. <laughs> like, she is... I'm not saying she's dumb. No, the gullible. I'm just saying. There's a, there's a, they're different, different, like, spectrums entirely. Right. And. But she was also just, like, not good to me, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so, yeah, she's the gullible, so the life room stage, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Alright, with that, I think I'm gonna call it a night. Um, yeah, it's pretty late. My phone's almost dead. I got a pretty decent amount done here. So, uh, with that, thanks to. Uh, ooh, I should pause the game. Alright, thank you to everybody watching. Thank you to everybody who uh, already was watching. Thanks to everybody who watches in the future on the po past broadcast tab or on the archive channel that you can find on the browser version down below. Um, also check out my Twitter at IggyDKid, that's where I'll tweet out when I'm going live, so keep an eye on that. Uh, my personal YouTube channel at IggyAndTheApe, that is, uh, where I post some stuff. Should be posting something soon, I'm trying to post more stuff there, but I've been doing a lot of other things. Um, yeah, if you haven't, please follow, it's free. If you have a Discord account, you just, or Discord, a Twitch account, you just click the heart up that way on the browser version to follow it's free it helps out a lot i'd appreciate a great deal andrew do you have any last things to say uh, don't forget to check the links that i shared with you uh in the chat here yes you yes before uh, i go let me put those into safari before i go off so that they don't uh disappear all right so with that... Uh, last words for me. Yes. Um, be excellent to each other and party on dudes. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Good night. Only to ya. Good night. Ah, hit the wrong button. Hold on.